Before we start this video, a monolithic thank you to Weon for the thumbnail of this video. Please give the man some support on Instagram as there is no one who deserves it as much as he does. Now back onto the video. To say that Horizon means a lot to me would be more than just putting things lightly. Horizon 2 was the game that 12 year old me aspired to play so strongly upon release. Saving every ounce of money I had until finally I could have the privilege to experience this near dream game of mine. About a year after it released, I had saved up for an Xbox One, and I'll never forget the day I popped that disc into my new to me Xbox and started my journey onto the series which little did I know would change my life. Eight years, three Horizon launches, a newfound purpose, community, and friendships that spawned from this one game sitting in my games collection later. You may wonder why I sit here writing a two hour long critique on a game that you would easily assume I should adore. Forza Horizon 5, the game I thank in part for helping me get to where I am on this platform, but begrudgingly hold just as much malevolence towards. Since the fourth game in the series, I was first in line to make my voice heard on the troubles and misdirected nature that the series was undergoing. This animosity continued leading up until the fifth game's release, leaning on the critical side of the community, but one that was misdirected. I fell victim to pointing out trivial and petty complaints instead of leading the charge with deep-rooted constructive critiques for the series. With Horizon 5, this fire fueled by the dichotomy of both love for this series and frustration towards its subconscious demise is one that burns stronger than ever. This video is a heartfelt, deeply passionate critique directed by two fans with over 7,000 play hours throughout all five installments who want nothing more than to have the series which brought us together find its flame again and burn brighter than ever. Without further ado, strap on in as we dive deep into Forza Horizon 5 and undergo the ultimate critique. The word psychology might not be the first thing that comes to mind when you think of Forza Horizon. Though in order to thoroughly understand where the series' fundamental change and missteps have gone within the past few years, it all stems from deep within the psychological approach to this series. But things get even more fascinating when you take a step back and look at Horizon's psychology from where the strings are pulled behind the consumerist mind of Xbox. During what many call the peak of Forza, Xbox as a brand was an entirely different beast than it is now. The seventh generation was Xbox's fully earned seat in the spotlight. The Xbox 360 was a tremendous success, not only due to the competitive nature of the console as a whole, but the games which sold it. You wanted shooters, you had Halo and Gears of War, RPGs with Fable and Lost Odyssey, fighting games such as Dead or Alive 4, and for racing, some of the greatest games in the history of the genre, with Project Gotham Racing and Forza Motorsports in their third and fourth entrances. Microsoft's flagship console sold itself through having the best games in its respective niche and genres, and it worked tremendously, an era already fondly remembered for some of the greatest exclusive lineups ever. Throughout the eighth generation, Xbox as a brand started to lose itself, trying hard to stray from its already tried and true path for the sake of expanding the Xbox platform to as many people as possible. This was done through a focus on multitasking and using your Xbox as an all-in-one media device instead of a strictly gaming console. From launch all the way to the end of the Xbox One's launch cycle, Xbox continually struggled and failed to find a footing in what this console was meant to be. And the games which sold the console, well, didn't. The Xbox One's games, which happened to be both exclusive and, well, good, were few and far between, leading one series in particular to become a strange and ill-fitted near poster child for the company. As most of Xbox's IPs and established titles faded into obscurity, Forza Horizon was the one that always seemed to keep growing and growing. From the original all the way up until the release of the third installment, Forza Horizon's recognizability as a household title rapidly shot up, 
due in part to the fact that, well, there wasn't much else out there that you would buy an Xbox for. So Forza was left holding a massive chunk of responsibility for not only its own series, but Xbox as a whole. Approaching the ninth generation of consoles, Xbox itself seemingly accepted their fate as to not having the most exclusive titles and marketed the end of the 8th generation era through its new approach to games, Game Pass. Game Pass was in short the new reason to buy an Xbox over any of its competitors and to sell Xbox Game Pass, what Xbox exclusive which had already been creeping into the households of the general Xbox community would fit the bill. That's right, Forza Horizon 4. Xbox Game Pass was Xbox's easy way to get Forza Horizon 4 into the hands of those who bought their Xbox for Game Pass to go, yeah, this game looks fun, might as well give it a shot. Looking at the modern day, the Xbox Series consoles have fully incorporated this new approach. You're no longer buying an Xbox, you're buying Game Pass. Because of this new approach, Xbox is no longer making these games for target audiences who are happy to pay $60 for a big game. These games have to be developed for as broad of a range as possible. This ranges from your casual Joe, who can hop on for 30 minutes after work, to hardcore gamers who game for as long as Joe over there works in a day. This newfound approach changes everything in terms of how these games are developed and marketed. Appeal is the number one goal, and games which focus on being open, free, and unlimited in terms of what you can do and when you can do it are easier to sell to those who aren't as interested in the first place. This psychology directly translates to Forza Horizon, and it's evident in every aspect of how these games have evolved over time. The original game had you play as a set protagonist, going through a series of predestined and classed races in order to climb the ranks and become the champion through a linear story. Conversely, in Forza Horizon 5, you play as a self-insert create-your-own character, choose exactly in which fashion you would like to do these races, in whatever car you would like, create your own events with the limitations exactly how you would like them, and all for the spirit of fun racing with no singular winner at the end, but a fleet of them. There are boundless parallelisms to the psychology in Modern Horizon, and we'll be bringing these up as we go throughout the video. But for now, let's move on to the basis of where the rest of the game is built off of. Horizon 5's map. For being the fifth entry in the series, we sure have run out of ideas fast, haven't we? Everything about Horizon 5 is something previously done in the series whilst offering nothing of its own. Seriously, think about it. If we turn back the clock to Horizon 2, it introduced a whole new physics and graphics engine along with a more dynamic weather. Forza Horizon 3 added, oh boy, the first fully open map. Horizon Editions, the first live service, crazy expansion ideas, drone mode, the convoy system, must I go on. Forza Horizon 4 added seasons, which drastically changed the map every week, and a much more fleshed out live system, while experimenting with new game modes like a root creator and the Super 7. So what does Horizon 5 offer? Genuinely thinking about it, the only concrete new addition that comes to mind is the improvement to the blueprint system which was in FH4, and means the community has to do all of the work and not play on games themselves. Wow, 10 out of 10, IGN. But trust me, this is all just the surface. I feel the element that best represents Forza's complete lack of innovation comes in full form when we come to take a look at the map. This dull, boring, outdated map. Let's have a look, shall we? Going through Forza history again, let's see how each map innovated on the series. Horizon 2 much improved the cities and towns over Forza Horizon 1 and included fully fleshed out playgrounds this time, including the oh so iconic airfield which has become a Horizon staple to this day. Forza Horizon 3 has a super distinct map split into three sections, the bottom being the more rural jungle area, the top left being the rugged outback with its iconic orange color palette and the top left being the high society server's paradise. All of these were new to Horizon and blended together perfectly to create one of the best maps in racing history. 
And that's not to mention its own special landmarks like the construction site, shipyard, Pink Lakes, Waterfall, Twelve Apostles, Byron Bay, another iconic airfield, and, well, I better stop there or we'll be here all day. Forza Horizon 4, as previously mentioned, included seasons to shake up the map's general vibe, color scheme, and physical traits, allowing for crazy set pieces like the massive Frozen Over Lake. Even seasons aside, we had other landmarks like the quarry, the beachside castle, and the best city in Forza to date, Edinburgh, being both visually distinct and fun to race in. So with all of this in mind, let's have a look at Horizon 5's map and see just what it brings to this franchise. Starting from the left, we have this pretty sick rally course that is completely ne- oh hang on, Horizon 4 has this. Never mind. Well, how about the dunes as a whole? Surely this is in- nope, Horizon 3 trademark right there. Okay, then the big jungle- nope also Horizon 3's. Alright, how about this massive volcano drift road? Nothing of this magnitude has been done before- oh, never mind, Fortune Island did. Oh, how about this sick lava seen in the trailers? Now that is new! Let's jump to the top of the volcano and- it's not there. Okay, uh, maybe it's seasonal then. Let's change the season and- no. No. Uh, no. It's just not in the game. The lava is there purely for the opening and this one expedition. Glorious. Here, let's look at this drag strip built into the festival. Now that, yeah, we all know Horizon 4 did this. And better, because it actually had Christmas trees, unlike Horizon 5's, which removed them. For some reason? How about a track that's finally built into the map? That's something Forza fans have been wanting for years, and they finally got it in... 2019. Yeah, remember LEGO? They did this first. Okay. How about this stadium plucked in the middle of the map with absolutely nothing in it? Hell, there isn't even a playground event set up here. Technically, it's not been done before, so uh, here's our new thing. A completely empty circle um, to make your own fun in. That's, uh, th that's oddly symbolic, actually. How about this rundown airfield? We've had airfields before, but not all overgrown like that. Yeah, no, they somehow thought this was a good idea two games in a row. We have a big bridge! Woo! Innovation number two! Bridge. Actually, no, this doesn't even count as we had something of equal size in Horizon 1 with the Hoover Dam. How the hell can you even have the biggest bridge in Forza Horizon- Oh my god, never mind. Okay, we have a canyon. A very small canyon, but a canyon nonetheless. Surely it's the first of its fine- Oh, for fuck's sake! Hmm, a beachside road specifically on the right side of the map. Now, why does it feel like I've been doing this for the past five years? I feel like carrying this on will just be video padding, so let's stop there. I'm sure you get the picture. The complete lack of its own individual ideas when it comes to the map ruins Forza's long-standing tradition of truly discovering these new landmarks because, well, I've seen these all before, and so have you. This stark lack of innovation would already be a sizable dent in the overall composition of Horizon 5's map, but in all honesty, it is the least of its issues, unfortunately. Tell me if this all sounds familiar to you. Hop on to Horizon 5 to drive your favorite car around for a bit, maybe to take some photos. You get stricken with this inexplicable feeling of loneliness and emptiness. Well, I'm here to explain that inexplicable feeling. To start, let's look at that general color palette of Horizon 5's map, crowded by lots of dull greens and browns, with the shift to a light auburny brown of sand to the right of the map and a bigger emphasis on green towards the bottom, with splotches of yellow thrown about the place. If this coloration is starting to remind you of the latest Fallout release, then you're on the right track. This map is a goddamn wasteland. No matter where you drive, there is just nothing. Nothing but these aimless, hardly connected roads, sand, and boundless fields of crops. Does this feel like an ideal setting for the latest and greatest Forza Horizon? The more you think about it, it really is no wonder they removed the beauty spots from this game now, isn't it? What adds to this is something Horizon 5 has, or rather does not have in relation to its previous entries. Take a look at all five of these clips on screen and tell me which one of these stands out as different. The keen eye of you watching should realize that Horizon 5 is the only one here not set in a modern landscape of buildings, or put more simply, a modern city. 
simply because it doesn't have one. Guanajuato is filled with extremely close bends and brick structures reminiscent of that of the 19th century. The idea of having a city like this is not a bad idea in concept for a game, but for a racing game. I dread every time I'm forced to race in this godforsaken place because of the unfair and restrictive pathing. A situation not at all familiar to something like Forza Horizon 4's Edinburgh's or Horizon 3's Surfer's Paradise. But now we're starting to get more into track design. It would be one thing to have just an ancient city for this game's setting, but the two notable towns or cities if you want to call that in this game have it even worse, filled to the brim with more tight layouts, this time even with dirt tracks in the mix to give you even more of that instant nostalgic feeling. What this instead accomplishes is a contrast between the latest and greatest sports and hypercars stuck in a place with absolutely zero modern civilization. Seriously, the most expensive house you can buy is a castle for fuck's sake. This right here is the origin for that tone and dread you feel when traversing this map that feels empty. It doesn't feel like humans were here, just that we're now stuck in this weird time capsule to a century ago. The latest and greatest tech in a place it doesn't belong. I understand that Horizon 5 is meant to showcase the history of Mexico as a country, but it's lost sight of that original goal and ended up being more so a museum for Mexico itself, rather than a place I'd actually want to race. This in turn paints Mexico in a far worse light than any of the previous Horizon games, which is a shame because Mexico really is a beautiful country but not because of what I've seen in Horizon 5. This is in stark contrast to something like Horizon 3, which made me personally admire Australia and in part be the instigator for my own trip there. Something Horizon 5 I don't think has replicated for anyone. So now we've landed on two major setbacks when it comes to Horizon 5's map design, but this isn't where it ends, unfortunately. So, all of these issues, you would assume they would get fixed in Horizon 5's expansions, eh? Well, let's get to them later. Horizon 5 has one last element of the map remaining to tear apart in order to truly understand why it fundamentally fails in every aspect. Let's take a look at the physical makeup of the terrain. I'll be honest here, this is Horizon 5's strongest aspect to its map, with three landmarks that are actually decently distinctive and fun to drive on. First is a small one. The massive bridge at the bottom of the map is something I do like just rolling over from time to time. The volcano, while being visually boring as all sin, does have a decent layout to it roadwise. And the canyon area is actually pretty fun to race in? Uh, yeah, that, that, that's it. That, that's all the good I have to say towards Horizon 5's map. The rest of it is, for lack of a better word, awful. As previously touched on before, Guanajuato is atrocious to race in. The festival track is bare as can be, and it feels like it is half of a track that just got ripped in half, with the other bit stranded into the nether never to be seen again. The bottom is just generic jungle, the right is dunes as far as the eye can see, and in the middle and the right of that, it's just flat, empty nothingness. I genuinely try to avoid the middle of the map as much as possible because, well, there's just nothing here. It's like it's doing its best impression of a Minecraft auto-generated world, but hell, even that comparison is doing Minecraft a disservice. When I drive from end to end of the highway in this game, the entire drive looks visually the exact same. Again, no previous Forza game has this issue. Why is it that Horizon 5 has this outstanding desire to bore me to sleep with this map both visually and layout wise? Its obsession with showing off the world's most detailed cacti has overtaken the idea of making an actual half decent map for this game. But hell, it can't even get quality right because sometimes you just run into shit like this. That or sometimes you'll start a rally race just to be taken out before you take the first corner because oh. What in the genuine shit is this tree root doing stuck on the road? And with enough force to stop a 120 mile an hour Subaru dead in its tracks. I just... what? Why? Both this and its oppressive tone of loneliness creates the worst map in Forza history by quite a large margin. A map that has failed to keep myself and others invested in playing this game that could have been a silver lining amidst all of the rest of the mediocrity that this game presents. But no, even Horizon 5's map, something Horizon has consistently been able to get spot on, falls short on every front. Okay, I need to get this off my chest right now. 
Why is this one road here marked as asphalt, but clearly not asphalt? How the hell did they A. Miss this, B. Still miss this for two years and still haven't fixed it? I just... Ugh. I'd like to touch on a bit of a theory I have for this game, specifically regarding its layout. As previously stated, it has bits of elevation specifically on the borders of the map, with a complete wasteland in the center. Now, this would of course make sense for a game mode in which the map is slowly closing in towards the middle, which players face off in straight line cost country racing in an almost battle royale-esque fashion in order to cash in on recent tra- I was joking. Why is this real? Yes, I genuinely believe that the map was compromised to the point of nothing around the center, literally because of this game mode. So let's talk about it, shall we? The Eliminator, for those of you who are blessed enough not to know, is Fortnite. Without anything that makes Fortnite good. Yes, I'm serious. Forza genuinely saw the Battle Royale trend of the late 2010s and said, oh boy, we sure should get a piece of that in our racing game. So for your entertainment and educational pleasure, I played 10 hours of this game mode to truly get an idea of it. And by me, I mean Serp, who is the one writing this segment. May God rest her soul. So here is what she discovered. This game mode is atrocious. I wish I was exaggerating when I tell you 80% of this is luck dependent. Let's go through the laundry list of ways this game can screw you over. First, you can watch as half the lobby spawns in purple level cars while you are stuck in a goddamn beetle. When starting a race with someone, sometimes the finish line will just spawn in the complete opposite direction you're going, and now your opponent has a half mile lead on you. Sometimes you'll just roll for no reason. Sometimes, even when you win a race, you get screwed over by the next level car being worse than the one you already have. Seriously, whose absolute dubious idea was it to put a Ferrari P4 in this game mode? For what purpose? Sometimes you'll be clipped by terrain and brought to a complete halt out of nowhere. And God forbid you get stuck in something rear wheel drive. But let's say you're lucky enough to make it to the final elimination round. You've got a decent car and oh, the finish line spot on the other side of the circle. And now the other four players have a mile lead on you. Isn't this fun? Not to mention, you must know beforehand where the cars will actually spawn. If not, then you'll just be permanently stranded in a beetle before being picked off by someone who does know where the cars spawn. All of this doesn't even go to mention the completely blank map. Driving cross country in a straight line just isn't very fun? Making this even worse is the complete lack of balance in the cars themselves. Like why is the RS6 a tier 2 car and X5 a level tier 4 car? They can easily dominate stuff two or three levels above. And then there are super weird choices like the ZL1 and previously mentioned P4. Sometimes when you've put in the work and actually made it to tier 10, you can actually get a useful car like an RS200 or a Brocky. Or you can get stuck in a road car like the Centenario or AMG1. Worse yet, stuck in the 1750 horsepower rear wheel drive Funko. Again, for what purpose? So here we have the groundworks for a brain melting mess of a game mode made to cash in on a trend. Surely it'll be consistently updated to improve on, just like the games it took inspiration from. This is the part where I tell you this game mode has remained identical for two years now, and poor completionists have to get at least one victory royale for the achievement. Despite how truly deplorable this game mode is, I genuinely don't have much more else to say about it. Like, the way the smoke trails blend into the storm wall is annoying as hell. As is the text that blocks your vision whenever you start a race, increasing the likelihood you smash into a random tree. Oh, but 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 uh, Ultraviolet, didn't you say that FH5 has no unique game modes? Doesn't this count as a unique game mode? Now, hold it right there, hypothetical straw man. You'd be right if this entire game mode wasn't started in Horizon 4 and was better there as well, because that was actually updated. So yeah, not even this ass-backwards game mode be a point for originality towards FH5. Honestly, I'm feeling my grey matter melt just thinking about this. So yeah, if you like bashing your head against the wall, give Eliminator a try. If you like good game design, eh, maybe steer clear. There's a lot of discourse when it comes to FH5, more so than I believe any Horizon game in the past. Unfortunately, a lot of this is centered around the subject of this segment of this video, the cars themselves. 
I'd like to make sure you understand this by immediately stating that outright, yes, the way cars were handled in this game is atrocious. However, it is not the sole defining flaw of this game, contrary to what most Forza fans would have you believe. When browsing comments, videos, or general discussions of why people dislike FH5, so much of it just boils down to the FH5 don't have 2004 Subaru Outback XT Turbo 3600 in the game. Something I think is a massive disservice to Forza as a game series. Feedback is an integral part of how a game will improve in future installments. Some people may argue that Playground Games doesn't listen to feedback because look how bad FH5 turned out, when, if you think about it, it's not 100% true. Take your mind back to the days of Forza Horizon 4. Not a bad game by all means, but one that was ripe with flaws. A pretty awful racing system, the removal of private lobbies, a still broken PI system, plus the first time where the Horizon formula was beginning to stale. With all of this in mind, what did the Forza community complain about? And what did FH5 heavily focus on in the marketing? Because of this, it's clear that Playground Games is at least somewhat listening to the community. So a portion of the fault lies with the community itself as to why FH5 has turned out the way it has. In fact, history is repeating itself already. The way cars are being handled in FH5 has improved dramatically over the past few months due to the non-stop complaints. Hell, even I'm a part of it with these videos here. That's why I want to make it clear to everyone watching that there is far more to Forza's drastic issues than the most surface level things like sounds and customization. Let's focus our efforts on lesser talked about problems next time. This all being said, beating a dead horse isn't to my taste. This being the ultimate FH5 critique, is it not? So it's time I finally, once and for all, put to bed the issue about how cars are handled in FH5 so I can never talk about it again once I upload this video. To start with, I must reiterate my points from my video on post-launch support, specifically in regards to Forza. Horizon's fourth entry managed to end its life cycle with a staggering 752 unique cars, a list comparable to that of the later Gran Turismo series. This in comparison to FH5 launching with rather, infamously, 534 cars. That is a drop of over 200 vehicles with notable additions lacking such as the Cadillac Escalade, Limo, Ferrari 599 GTO and 599XX, the AMG GTS, Koenigsegg Agera, Peels, Mercedes SL65, the Noble, the Gurkha, the Denvo, and the IDR, all missing at launch. Some of which have returned, some of which still remain missing to this day. This is quite considerably the largest drop in cars from one game to another. For comparison, the jump from FH3 to 4 was a loss of approximately 60 cars. To have such a drastic decrease, even including series staples, was utterly baffling. The community had no idea why Playground had done this. We considered the idea that the models were being redone for next gen, but this was quickly disproven when we got our hands in the game and discovered, nope, these cars are all ports from FH4, which were ports from FH3, which were ports from FH2, which were ports from FM5, you get the picture. So the community was stuck yet again. How come so many iconic cars were just Thanos snapped out of nowhere? Well, a few months later, we got our answer. Say it with me now, recycling. All the cars missing from FH4 to 5 would be periodically added to the game over its live service, an absolutely scummy technique which we'll get into later, to artificially increase the lifespan of the game without actually having to do any work. This is absolutely sickening, especially when you consider the game already feeds itself playtime by making you rework all of the cars that you lost transitioning from 4 to 5. On top of this, they've also locked access to a ton of vehicles to be unobtainable until a certain date in the future. Keep in mind, we had to wait an extra year of development, so there's absolutely zero excuse to not have the entire roster included at launch. But, but, oh, uh, uh, Ultraviolet, it's just a licensing issue, but they need extra time to make sure all the cars work in the game first. Yeah. We all know neither of these are true, except for very specifications like the Stellantis vehicles. If this was true, they would have come out and said it, like the situation with Stellantis. But no. Instead, we get fed lies about how the cars are being updated, just for them to remain identical to the previous game. Don't believe me? There's plenty of literal evidence cars are being withheld from us that are fully realized in the game.
Let's have a look, shall we? Here are a bunch of thumbnails of unused cars found in the data files. But this is not all. Let's have a quick lightning round, shall we? Here's a Porsche Boxster in the Series 4 update trailer. Here's a CCX at 36 seconds of the Hot Wheels reveal trailer. Here's an Evora S on a playlist thumbnail. Here's the base Vulcan on a playlist thumbnail. Here's the 2012 Vanquish and base Wyra on the anniversary title screens. Here's a Hudson Hornet on a playlist thumbnail. Here's a Tuscan on a playlist thumbnail. Here is both a 906 and a 928 on one of Forza's official Instagram posts. Keep in mind, all of this is without seeing what the depths of the game files have to offer. And again, keep in mind that the cars that do come back from Horizon 4 to 5 still have the exact same license plate model as in Horizon 4, not the updated one for 5. If all of this has not convinced you yet that this is just straight porting and holding cars back for the lack of extending the game as much as possible, then I'm genuinely sorry. Please see a therapist. Not only is this incessant need to withdraw these cars from us, restricting the lineup of familiar cars, but it compromises the new cars that get added too. During the course of 2022, we had months of playlist that was nothing but pure recycled cars. And well, we'll get to these in a second. This in comparison to the old days where we used to get DLC packs every month with a minimum of seven completely new to the Xbox One series of games per month to now. One month of four cars that were in the last game. Do you see how this is an issue? This has caused Forza to fall way behind on dates of cars actually unveiling, only able to get their hands on modern released cars like the Nissan Z and GR86 literal years after their release. In contrast to games like Forza Motorsport 6 and Forza Horizon 3, which launched with cars with production years ahead of which the year the game launched in. This gets even worse when you consider the actual new cars being… For those of you who aren't adept in the world of car culture, I'll be blunt and say that these Chinese cars are just straight up lazy cop out. These cars are easy to license, these manufacturers are very willing to share them with the public, and an easy way for Forza to make some quick cash. Therefore, focusing on these instead of actual content that us players want. And it also tags into this game's lack of a Mexican identity. You know how each previous Horizon game liked to focus on car culture from the setting of the game? Like how Horizon 3 had plenty of iconic Holdens and Ford Falcons. And how Horizon 4 has its array of British motoring history. FH5 has, uh, one Mexican car. And it's not even native to this game, it was in FH4. I just… how do you do that? Forza's brand new romantic crush on the great red and yellow country has caused each player's reaction to the playlist of the time being, oh boy, three more recycled cars, I sure hope the new to Forza car isn't, oh for fuck's sake. Like, you guys made a trailer, specifically for Chinese cars. Like, guys, at least be subtle about your feelings. Thankfully, Forza's inflation seems to have died down over the course of 2023. Speaking of which, I don't want this section to be entirely negative. Forza has actually been improving the cars being rolled out to us as of recent, finally letting us get our hands on actual new cars that players want, and finally giving us the long-awaited return of dedicated DLC packs. I feel like this is best exemplified with the return of Stellantis. While I feel as though the FH5 or yesteryear would have dragged this out for 3 months, thankfully this year we got a good chunk of Stellantis cars just casually dropped into the auto show, with the rest being spread out over the playlist. Though to make up for the lack of new cars, we got a dedicated 7 car DLC pack full of highly requested modern cars that fit the theme of the update. It does give me hope that Forza has started to get their act together and knows how to deal with their cars efficiently. Now if you could just shadow drop the rest of the cars we know you're still holding from us in the auto show in the next update, that would be lovely. That's about all I have to touch on for how the cars are covered externally. Now how about internally? How are the cars once you have your hands on them? Well, for starters, the sounds have had a definite upgrade. Yeah, that's pretty much all the nice I have to say. Let me tell you why this is atrocious. As stated previously, most of these models are old. Like, old. If these cars were really being updated, well, the S15 and R34 wouldn't still look like this, now would they? And then there's moments like the NSX's engine bay out in the wild, and the X-Class it did they fix that? Oh wow, they did! Well, here's what the engine bay used to look like. <laughs> Speaking of engine bays, let's look at the upgrade system. New to FH5 is, uh, uh off-road tires are available on most cars now, and you can increase and decrease the amount of gears. Yeah, pee. 
that's all that's new. We still live in a world where engine swaps and making things all-wheel drive, and more or less making every single car work identically is the way to succeed. No room for variation in this Horizon game. I'd like to add, while not an exclusively Horizon 5 thing, whenever you engine swap your car, it closes off the ability to look at your engine bay in Forza Vista, even though half of the time you can still see the engine is just the stock appearance. Like, come on man. <laughs> Other than that, there really isn't that much to say in regards to the cars themselves. They act just about the same as any other Forza game when it comes to driving, apart from a few small improvements. I could go off on a bunch of car-specific bugs to pad video length, but I don't think that'd be particularly interesting. As a closing point on the cars of FH5, I'd like to hope that Playground Games and other developers can use FH5 as an example as to why gatekeeping cars is a scummy practice and to never do it the way FH5 has done, something the crew Motorfest has drastically improved on. Not only keeping every single vehicle they can, only dropping an odd 30 because of ditched car classes, but also allowing you to transfer your entire The Crew 2 garage into Motorfest, because the game is confident in its own content and not relying on forcing its own players to regrind for cars they've owned for the past decade in order to serve as game length. Campaigns and single player stories are an essential part of any racing game, especially in regards to an open world focused racer. They set the basis for how the rest of the game is structured, by getting the player used to mechanics, physics, general variety in gameplay, and allowing you to hone your skills while having fun and learning the game throughout. Forza Horizons have been changing the mantra in what approach campaigns should take, and Forza Horizon 5 is a textbook example of an inherently flawed campaign. And to demonstrate just how Forza Horizon 5's approach is so frowned upon, let's go through it and point out some critical weak points, shall we? Forza Horizon 5's initial drive can be described in one word, superficial. A good opening should get you hooked on a teaser which shows you sneak peeks at what to expect throughout the game, and Forza Horizon 5 blatantly lies to you. The initial drive pumps up everything that the Forza Tech engine has on offer, making this world feel alive by choosing select routes in which to pump up the graphical fidelity, presence of vehicles and animals, all in an attempt to add more drama to Horizon Mexico. Of course, it looks good, but first impressions aren't everything. As we'll see going further throughout this campaign, beauty here is nothing more than skin deep, and fades away as the minutes and hours pass, revealing the bare, empty, soul underneath. Looking at these roots in any other race, it's clear to see just how much of that life fades away. It's also so emblematic that this is the first Horizon game to somehow make the cover car, which is debatably the coolest in the series history, so sinfully uninspiring and poor to drive, understeering all over the place and unfortunately is dreadfully uncompetitive, a series first for cover cars. Upon arrival at the Horizon Festival, it's time to create our own protagonist, Drake. Horizon 5 is not the first game in the series to adopt the create your own self insert archetype, yet it is still worth calling out, as delegating all character traits to be up to the imagination of the player is inherently killing any and all chance of a likable character, something that having a set protagonist will 10 times out of 10 be better for. An asterisk on this though, those who whine about such incongruent and minuscule complaints such as pronouns being a one-time selection instead of genuine criticism need to take a moment and realize how ridiculous and trivial that really is, if you think about it. Once Drake is all dressed up handsome and ready to rock and roll, it's time to pick our first car. Choosing your first car means, uh, uh, nothing. You get all three of them dropped off in your garage no matter what you choose, boiling down this crucial choice down to simply which you want to drive first. Once Drake is equipped with his first car, it's time for the Big Bonanza Showcase event, what's supposed to be a pandemonious introduction to the headline events in Horizon 5 by making you do events that were in the previous games. It does not matter how many slow motion shots you toss in to try and pandemorize the cavalcade of tropes we've seen before in previous games. Planes, bikes, jumps, guys, this is the big showcase of what to expect from Horizon 5's most glamorous moments, and it's recycled concepts from previous titles with a fancy coat of paint to wow the newcomers. Incredible. Alright, with our first showcase unfortunately completed, we've got access to Horizon's story, 
What's marketed as the engaging replacement for having a structured story throughout the game. And yet, there is nothing engaging about watching your custom character and generic cardboard stereotypes engage in dreary, mind-numbing dialogue from 10 feet away, which is engaging. Forza. Basic dialogue design, which was apparent in even previous entries, either puts the player in the position of being spoken to, or close enough whereas you feel as the focal point of conversation. And this isn't even to mention the writing. There is not a single character here which is remotely entertaining, interesting, or even able to crack a slight smile out of me. Dialogue is either drab exposition about these characters who you don't know or care for, or them trying obnoxiously hard and making a joke out of Spanish with this insensitive Spanglish which ends up sounding something like Hello guys, would you like to race with my amigos on the weekend? Vamos! The gameplay as well. This first event involves you blasting through a sandstorm under pressure to take a highly sought after photo of an ancient statue in the midst of a storm. Nice. Oh, and that time limit we had to drive a good 3 kilometers was 8 entire minutes, in which Drake finished in just over 1. Alright, so we've been playing for a good 30 minutes at this point, and as you do at the start of a new game, let's go and try driving a new vehicle. I just so happened to take a peek at my own cars, and we are already at 13 cars. This including hypercars like an Apollo IE and a McLaren Senna. And before you say loyalty rewards, this was a brand new account created strictly for this video. All of these cars are thrown at us because of Horizon 5's mantra of freedom and the ability to do whatever we want, when we want. And this is highlighted by what the campaign has us tackle next. Horizon 5's campaign is entirely focused on that psychology of do anything, anytime, as we've mentioned throughout this video allowing for literally the first road race of my own volition to be done in an Apollo IE. I'm still literally level 1 game, how is this even acceptable? After experiencing the most mundane track design courtesy of Horizon 5's eliminator focused wasteland of a map and equally lifeless Dravatars, who will get their own spotlight later on, it's time to be rewarded for your efforts after NLE Choppa here hits the Quan on them folks. Fortnite reference. Forza Horizons throughout their legacy have always prioritized your rewards upon race completion, a demonstration through visual narrative that the race that you just completed was for the purpose of winning and spoils. 5 was the first game to completely flip the script here and delegate your rewards to a tiny post-race notification you probably won't even notice. This new narrative is that of celebrating the race itself. It doesn't matter if you came first or 16th, Horizon 5 is about the race itself. And why should we celebrate one player gaining more than the other? Which is immediately contradictive of the literal emoting and podium beforehand. This dichotomy here is the perfect demonstration of Horizon 5's impossible mission. Racing is definitively a competition. There are no participation trophies and equal victorious status for all. You race to win. Horizon 5 hiding those eco rewards yet at the same time placing the winners on a pedestal is ever so emblematic of just how lost this game's direction is. And on that same note, have I mentioned you can do any race in any car you want yet? Dedicated classes have been a part of Horizon's racing structure since its origin, giving us the player a set group of championships in which we have to build and choose the ideal car for. This restricted player choice allows you to have fun with cars that you like, but not stick to being a one-trick pony and allow yourself to explore the game's car list, find new things you would have never thought to have liked, and even do some races you may not like. And that's okay. Horizon 5 said, screw this, and abandon these themed championships for blueprints. I hate to keep bringing up the unshackled and self-directed design of Horizon 5, but when it's this deeply rooted as to where every single event in the game must be completely customized by you, the player, resulting in the ability to make every single race a one lap long and take whatever car you want, whenever you want to in any service or event type, it's infuriating. As after all, what's even the point of developing a game if you leave it all in the player's hand on how it's presented to them? When you go to a restaurant, you order a delicious meal to your taste from the selection given to you as the chefs in the back know how to use all of the ingredients given to them and work their hardest to present you with their finest work, as they, after all, know best. 
Horizon 5 tosses you that same kitchen with the ability to create any dish imaginable, purposely sabotaging and disrespecting everything that its chefs stand for, just to allow its clients to make a dish that they don't have the knowledge of making, hammering in that this restaurant isn't even for them in the first place. That's enough about restaurants. As Drake decided to continue his racing journey off the beaten path in a McLaren setup, I don't think it takes Colin McRae to see how this is a bit superfluous. The fact that a slick tired rear wheel drive Senna mere millimeters from the ground is tackling this race with the same adeptness as a fully fledged rally car is truly shameful. And it highlights the issue Forza Horizon has had for years now, letting all cars be able to tackle any terrain no matter how unrealistic. After getting past that threshold of accolade points, Horizon 5 is ready to reward you with the single most useless feature carried over from the last game, Houses. Here is a brief house tour from a 12 year old game, Test Drive Unlimited 2. I can walk through the fully customizable and furnished interior, have a cat, hell, even go to my garage which is full of my favorite cars. Let's do a house tour in Forza Horizon 5. Thank you for watching. You know, I had hoped that the three years in between Horizon 4 and 5 would have allowed Playground to do literally anything new with the houses, uh, but uh, yeah, no. Their only purpose is to serve as fast travelable checkpoints, that in which become completely obsolete once you buy the fast travel anywhere house, meaning that once you do so, you'll maybe set it as your spawn point and never once touch any of the others again. Resuming our campaign, we get treated to another wonderful checklist in which this game loves so much. This one being the true main benchmark as to how we go about progressing through our story. I don't think I need to state why exactly this level of freedom is poor yet again, and especially when you see what happens when we come back to this in a few short minutes. But for now, let's continue our path by setting up the road racing festival. The questionable usage of terrains is brought up next when it's time to set up the Horizon Apex Outpost, the pinnacle of road racing as it's marketed, and we do so by challenging a storm in a trophy truck off-road. Yes. One completely random thing I wanted to mention about this race right here is the OST. This game's soundtrack selection is truly and utterly horrendous, but the composed pieces utterly fantastic. Just take a listen to this track for a second. It's honestly a shame that they put so much effort and clear passion into tiny slivers of this game, yet leave the rest so painfully monotonous and unendearing. Back to the current expedition at hand, however, the handholding continues when you reach your main objective, relegating tasks which are completely necessary in order to set up this festival to optionable check marks. Again, why are we even playing a game in which every single task is completely up to player agency? That psychology of Forza and Xbox not even daring to ask the player to do something they might not want to do, even if it's simply a 30 second task such as some of these, is an excruciating example of how obvious this mindset is. By the way, I've always found it hilarious that we set up the road racing festival canonically by driving to a historic ruin, dealing with a storm, and then driving to a small village in Tulum, where- Oh, wow, oh my god, so cool, the plane transitioned to a festival. That's, um, yeah, sure, Forza. You'll have some time to mess around with your newly manifested festival before- Oh. New feature. I, I I sure hope it works. Uh, no? Uh, please? Please? I swear on Fruit's life, I was pressing the button that whole time, as evident when the cutscene times out, the prompt working. This game has been out for two whole years now, by the way. Um, just haven't bothered to fix that, I guess. Hence, we continue the pattern of Horizon stories with exuberant time limits, repetitive road rally, yet drag races? Let's try these. Oh, it's road races, but just in a straight line. There's no Christmas tree, no different mechanics or anything, just a half mile road race that happens to not have any corners. I've said the word emblematic, what feels like a million times in this script, but I swear, when you really look at how empty every aspect in this game is, it really makes you wonder how this still sits at Metacritic's must 
play, alongside games like, you know, The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, Resident Evil 4, Final Fantasy VII, and even other racing games like the original Gran Turismo. This watered-down, pathetic slap in the face to the series is a must-play, worthy of as much praise as some of the most influential games of all time. God, what has journalism come to? Now you might be wondering, alright, we've started to get our footing in the campaign now, so what's our real motivator? Well, narratively, we hear about a Hall of Fame, but aside from that, there's nothing to go off of. Hell, we haven't even seen what this supposed Hall of Fame means, making that pretty much redundant, so let's just keep working. Oh. For those who have played the Horizon series since 3, you'll know that the Goliath marks the final race of the game a true showcase and amalgamation of what the racing and map of the current installment has to show you. We are two hours in, and we've unlocked it. There is no gaining a specific amount of accolades or stars. Heck, even having built all festival outposts. Nope, you can unlock their final race two hours in. So I did, and after doing so, I managed to gain over 15 XP levels and millions of credits worth of currency and cars. Again, let me just repeat that. Two hours in. I've finished the final race and have a fleet of over 25 cars, including plenty of hypercars. It's honestly not surprising in the slightest that you would be forgiven for thinking this is the end of the game because, well, it never really does end. Sure, you can go on to enter the Hall of Fame, which really doesn't take that much longer. And if you do, your reward is a cutscene. A cutscene which doesn't celebrate anything. You simply drive up and see your Xbox gamer pick parked up next to a selection of randomized players, rubbing in the message that this game no longer being one of self-fulfilled victory, but one of you being one of many winners. God, we are seriously at the level with racing games, where being a victorious champion is deemed too controversial. So we have to ensure that the player knows they aren't the only one. What a genuinely horrendous, shameful excuse of a campaign. And what makes this design approach laughably poor is that it's evident that not even the casual players who the game was watered down for even played long enough to experience most of this. Now while I can't validate these statistics to be 1000% accurate, they do give a good gist of what to expect. Looking at tracked achievements from both Xbox themselves and true achievements, we can see that anywhere from 10 to 31% of Forza Horizon 5 players actually reach the Hall of Fame. 15 to 39% unlocked the Goliath, again, the race you can get two hours into the game, and only 40 to 70% bought a car from the auto show. If this doesn't go to show you how little most of the community that this game gets watered down for even plays this game, what will? If appealing to the masses is the goal here, you certainly haven't done any appealing, now have you? What's happened is not only have you exiled the fanbase which brought Forza to the level it is, spat in their faces, and ditched them for a wider audience who won't even spend more than a few hours on this game, and never touch it again, single-handedly killing both birds with one hell of a stone. The live service vacation of modern games is a crazy rabbit hole that is something others far smarter than I have already criticized to hell and back, but I don't think I've ever seen someone truly tackle what makes Forza's live service tick, or rather, not. So right here, right now, I want to truly dissect the festival playlist and expose it for the abomination it is. And what an awful excuse for live service this truly is. But simply ranting about this isn't going to help anyone. So as we go throughout the playlist, I'm going to present ideas for changes to make it the best it possibly can be, and enjoyable for all players involved. For starters, your incentive to play the playlist is these exclusive cars that can only be found here. I'll tell you what this is right out the gate. Stupid. This right here plus the auction house is how you turn your game into cryptocurrency faster than Elon can ruin Twitter. Oh, I'm sorry. X. Not only does this mean people are going to be selling digital cars for hundreds of dollars on the Facebook marketplace, it also means casuals are going to be extremely confused when a car they want to drive isn't in the auto show. 
but instead delegated to the rabid cycle of the playlist. Many people watching may not realize this cause um, devotists, such as myself who log on every week to get these cars, wouldn't see the issue when a new player logs on, wants to pick up their favorite Japanese anime car, the A86, a car notorious for being a cheap alternative going on the auction house for $8 million. Not only is it just relegated to fan favorite classics either, newly made cars people want to experience in games are stuck to this cycle as well. The Nissan Z, Toyota GR86, Rimac Nevera, Porsche 992 GT3, and so many more are not obtainable to new players because they're locked behind massive paywalls due to their rarity. And this is the game that's meant for casuals, right? Not to mention, this is still unfair to even the devotists. What if they had something like, yeah, a life and couldn't play Forza for two weeks for one reason or another? I myself experienced this going to Australia for a month, meaning that that entire month's cars were completely unobtainable for me. Amazing. If a car you like isn't in the playlist during that time, suck it up and go auction hunting for the next four hours and be prepared to spend hundreds of millions of credits. So, what's the solution for this kerfuffle? Well, what I've come up with in an easy two seconds is really simple. Literally just add the playlist cars to the auto show after the series is complete. This still gives incentive to get the cars in the playlist because you'll be able to earn these new cars up to a month early. Plus, you won't have to pay for them with credits. If you're scared your car NFTs won't be a valuable that way, maybe do something as simple as mark the car with a little sign to demonstrate that it came from the playlist, or something else as simple as playlist tires would work. This way both long term fans can get their rewards for playing the game, and casuals don't get screwed out of driving new and exciting cars. Cause let me tell you, the current method is not incentivizing casuals to hop on every week. People who I see are just fed up with this and say that they'll just wait until the next Forza game comes out to get their chance at these cars. If gatekeeping cars is the only way Forza can market their upcoming game, then that is absolutely terrifying for the future of this industry. Let's switch gears now and have a look at the playlist itself, taking place over each season. Actually, you know what, never mind, we're talking about this now. How in the genuine hell did they manage to ruin seasons? You know how in Horizon 4, when every week the map would look crazy different? Well, here comes FH5, the epitome of mediocrity and playing it safe. Having snow? Nah, we have people who said they didn't like that. This is FH5, no negativity allowed. Everything needs to be perfect and happy, so the seasons now no longer actually change much. No snow, no the autumn, no increases in water levels. Nah, all that changes is the volcano has two millimeters of snow on it a quarter of the time. Surely that's enough reason to add snow tires in the game now. How dare we have the audacity to try to come up with something different than last game. People complained so now we get the same shit all month round. See, no snow anymore. Are you guys happy now? No, 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 no. Instead, we have this hit new replacement called Evolving World. You know it's important because it's a whole thing on the accolade screen. So what the hell does Evolving World entail? Does the map constantly update radically? You know, like Fortnite, the game they already shamelessly want to be so badly. This map is already piss shit enough. Surely this means they'd actually improve it over the years. Uh, no. No, of course not. What evolving world actually entails is, and I shit you not, please stick with me here, signboards. It's donut month? Let's add donut signs on the specific area of the map. It's Italian season? Here are these random stolen JPEG alpha signs. But wait, there's more! Sometimes, and I mean extremely sometimes, they'll dump a bunch of props and ramps into the arena like a child's first time with a Smash Bros stage builder. Where's the footage of this, you may ask? Well, I don't have any, because they remove it after one month so it's back to being boring, empty, nothingless. This right here, this is what this tab on the accolade screen is. Signboards, with no permanent changes whatsoever. I just... 
<laughs> I'm done. I, I can't make this video anymore. I can't, I can't think about this game. It's actually giving me a headache. This is a 10 out of 10 game. This is the future of racing games right here. This. Fuck this, bro. I'm becoming a Gear Club Unlimited 2 YouTuber now. At least that game has snow. What was I talking about again? Oh, right. This hunk of garbage. Let's start with a brief history of the playlist structure. The playlist prototype was first introduced half a year into Horizon 4's life as a sort of concept for what the future of Forza's live service could be. This prototype hasn't changed in four and a half years now. Forza Horizon 5, where innovation comes to die. Let's start with the Forzathon challenges, which are a good idea in concept, focusing on a specific car with rich history and having you experience what it's all about. This all falls apart though when you realize it's actually just a four-step checklist that wants you to buy car, drive car five miles, finish race in car, do the same jump three times in car. Woohoo. Now I'm not sure I even have to put this simply. It's boring, and something I usually skip in order to get points, but as said earlier, the concept really isn't that bad. So how do we fix this? Literally just stop half-assing it. We can keep the checklist format, but let's actually try and make it interesting this time. Have the first stage be to not only buy the car, but have a small text scroll on the history of the car like an FM4 or even FH3. Step 2 can be upgrading it to the specification the car used to race in, or in a way that fits the car's history. Step 3 can be running a time trial and needing to beat a specific time, and step 4 can be to race against other cars important to the car focus. For example, if it was on the GT40, you could either have it race a Ferrari P4, or even race the 2005 and 2017 Ford GTs. Simple changes like this would improve this feature drastically and actually incentivize players beyond just getting points towards a new car. Next on the festival playlist is the- oh good lord. The trial is uh... yeah we're coming back to this one. For now let's just move on to the blueprint events, which for all it's worth is the best part of the playlist. It's the only thing that's ever new, but the issue being the quality and choices can vary dramatically. Sometimes you'll be given the track that blows your socks off, and the next will look like the mind of the average BMW iX owner. That didn't age well. Otherwise, they're enjoyable enough, so I wouldn't alter these aside from having a little more quality assurance on what gets added. After that is the championships, which are the most… fine. Like it's really good we actually get restriction races, but otherwise they're the most stock standard you can get. How I'd improve these is a similar case to the Forzathon challenges, add a little bit more flair to them and make them more specialized. Like a choice of very specific car like a P1 LaFerrari and a 918, and you race against two AI using the other two at the hardest difficulty. Even something like that would be fine, but if we're forced to have them as they are, they're fine. Following that is the Playground Games, which is pretty atrocious. For one, you're forced to play in teams, which sometimes are literally mismatched. The game modes themselves are all very much outdated and need retooling, but let's be honest, this is FH5 where innovation comes to die. This would have been at the very bottom of the list of worst playlist events due to the above mentioned issues, but they at some point changed it so you don't even have to win to score points, which is a definite improvement especially considering the mismatched teams, but if the only way to fix your game is to make it so you literally just don't have to win, A, that's really emblematic of this entire game, and B, stupid. And you should know that this is an atrocious game mode based off of this information. I genuinely don't have a solution for this other than just reworking the playground games modes entirely. Plus make it free for all and require you to reach just the top 50% to get the points. No more of this mishmash teams BS thankies. Moving on we have PR stunts, which what the hell am I even meant to say about these? They're PR stunts. They're boring, tedious, and don't really have that much of a way to be improved. They're just quick points when you have 6 remaining until you unlock what you need. After this is dailies, which just scrap these. They're more of a checklist than the other checklist mode. Why is everything that gives you Forzathon points just checklist simulator? This includes Horizon Live events. Think I forgot about those? 
Well, I wish I did. Checklist Simulator 2021 has still not changed from FH4. Moving on, we have the photo challenge, which, oh, oh. I wanted to move on from Checklist Simulator, but this one is unabashedly a checklist. I just, I don't know what to say anymore. My improvements have literally just been be original, and I genuinely can't think of anything substantial enough other than just straight up reworking the entire system. Anyway. Now we have the treasure hunt, which is... This is actually all this is, huh? But no, 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 no. This checklist is so vague and dysfunctional at times that you need Google for it to work properly. Now that is innovation. How have they managed to make the entire live service for this game literally just this in disguise and think it was even remotely okay? Only the Playground Games directors could get around with making their game a literal real-time job. My goodness. Lastly, we have Rivals, and thank god this isn't a sheet of paper with boxes to tick this time. Rivals is a super basic concept, it's just setting a clean lap in a rental car. The fun of this one all depends on if you have a friend to compete with and one-up your scores, but alone, there's nothing really to get out of this one, nor does there really need to be, just get your points and move on. No real improvements necessary. Okay, the playlist is a steaming pile of fruit food that I don't have to talk about anymore, right? Okay, let's talk about the trial. This is infamous for a reason. I'm gonna start with the least bad part first, the AI. Yes, the AI is the LEAST bad part of this game mode. The same ones that'll either A, constantly block the road, B, slow down and crash you out of the checkpoint for no good reason, or C, commit the iconic Forza AI trope of being a literal whole mile ahead and being unbeatable to anyone. In general, they are a total mess, especially considering their immovable objects that can be pushed no matter how hard you ram them. Almost like the game has to be able to somehow prevent you from just cheesing the AI with its atrocious checkpoint system. Yeah, we're talking about this now. Think about Mario Kart for a second. Beloved fan favorite game. Now what if the next Mario Kart game included really tight flags you had to drive in between in order to finish a lap? And not being able to hit said flag means you have to drive back for it. Doesn't that sound... dumb? Now imagine that, but in Forza. Oh wait, you don't have to. I feel like Forza has normalized this checkpoint system so much that people don't realize how deplorable this is. The fact that your entire race can just end because one person rammed you at this specific point is just stupid. The fact that your race can end because you took a corner a little too tight or wide is stupid. The fact that something so easily manipulable have survived this long is actually disgusting. Manipulatable by not only your AI, but also your teammates. Said teammates that don't know what race etiquette is don't know what brakes are, and sure as hell don't know what upgrades are. Some people must say, oh, but this isn't Playground's fault, it's the player's fault for being bad. Yeah, no. Playground is absolutely enabling this. This game promotes while grinding and smashing into other players to stop. It promotes players to ram into each other because there's no repercussion to any of it. There's no barrier of entry to the trial. Any level 2 dipshit in their wheelspin car can enter and drag the whole team down for everyone. Remember that one time in FH4 the Mosler was locked behind completing the trial, but the game mode was so awful they had to give it up for free afterwards anyway? You'd think a game mode that astronomically fundamentally awful would be either scrapped or heavily reworked in the future game. <laughs> Are you kidding me? This is Forza Horizon 5, where common sense, game design, and innovation come to die. It is still identical to how it was in FH4, and now gives the most points out of any playlist event. When I first started writing about the playlist, I genuinely didn't realize how pathetic it was until I took an objective look at it for this script. Either filled with non-functioning game modes or endless checklists that have been normalized to the Forza wage slaves who have been doing this for half a decade now. Might I remind you, this is still a prototype system from five years ago. Something any other game dev would have taken the time to carefully improve and refine over the years, but no no no. 
Playground directors will settle for the absolute most mediocrity and never change a damn thing as long as it boosts player numbers. Simply because that same player has a car that they like, which is locked behind all of the playlist roadblocks. The playlist might just be one of the worst excuses for live service I've seen in a game thus far. And in this day and age, with games like Overwatch 2 and all the other worthless cash grabs plaguing the industry, that's a damn low bar. Expansions in the older Horizon titles of the Xbox One era always followed a sort of roadmap, with each game releasing its first expansion around two months after release, this being a very off-road focused expansion, Storm Island, Blizzard Mountain, and Fortune Island as examples here, while the second expansion would release about six months later and would be a brand tie-in. Fast and Furious, Hot Wheels, and LEGO Speed Champions to fit that category. Now, the idea of breaking the formula is an idea that's been tossed around for a while when it comes to these expansions. Maybe ditching the brand deals for something new and inspiring. Or even get a fabled expansion 3 for a Forza game. The idea of change to a formula of this expansion roadmap is not actually a bad idea, which is why FH5 is the perfect example of what not to change about a formula. So picture this, two months after FH5's release, no expansion news in sight. That's odd, maybe they're spending extra time to make it something of even higher quality. Another two months come and go, still nothing. The fanbase is starting to get a bit anxious, but still hopeful. Another two months pass. It's April now, and no news at all? This time now would be when the second expansion would have been revealed for any other Forza game, and we still haven't even gotten one for FH5? May rolls around when finally, nah, still nothing. I mean, are the expansions even a thing anymore? There's an expansion pass on the Microsoft Store. It is it a scam? The next month comes and we finally, and I mean finally, get our first trailer. So what on earth took them such a long time to come up with? Hot Wheels. Yeah, the same expansion from FH3. Uh, they, they took eight months for this. Not to mention this would be releasing in July, which by that time for any other Forza game, the second expansion would have been out a month prior. So all of this wait for an expansion we've already had before and doesn't look to be radical enough of a departure from the original expansion. Yeah, sure, it looks better than its Horizon 3 counterpart, but that's a given with modern technology. Otherwise, that's one of very few things it really has on this FH3 cousin. Let's compare the two directly to see just how FH5's pales in comparison and fits in with the overall theming of Horizon 5's downgrades. Remember early in the video how an FH5's map is in desperate need of modern civilization to give that aspect of modernity to it. Surely Hot Wheels would be the expansion to rectify this with an already amazing city in Horizon 3's expansion. With modern technology, we'd surely get a way bigger and great- yeah, you already get where this is going. You want a run-down rural house stuck on the side of a canyon? Th that's the best you get here. Well, if we can't have modern cities, then we should at least get some decent natural environments. Yeah, about that. Here's where FH5 fails drastically. As you can see by looking into this map, it's cornered off into three sections, suspended high in the air, above the base map. I honestly think an idea for an expansion literally miles above the base map is actually pretty sick in concept, especially for Hot Wheels, and I enjoy seeing how panning the camera down you can actually see the base map, though the same can't be said for vice versa. This concept all falls apart at this really strange pizza style structure, which makes the world feel super artificial. An artificial world doesn't have to be a bad thing necessarily if it's done right. Take the Storm Realm from Accelerasis for example. It has a lot of the same elements as FH5 Hot Wheels, but it has a much more coherent theme and structure making it a whole lot more appealing and immersive. While in FH5, sometimes you're in the snow. Next, you're in a giant jungle which feels loosely connected by these giant platforms, and it all just feels so... fake. I feel as though this map could have worked a lot better just on the ground with none of this weird machinery and instead all of these biomes naturally converged into each other. If you were going for a more mechanical theme, why not actually lean into it with, uh, I don't know, a city? Comparing directly to FH3, which took place directly over a massive body of water, which is already more believable in this fantasy setting, Hot Wheels tracks being in connection via a big line of archipelagos and the city in the upper right, it feels so much more coherent and natural while FH5's does not. 
almost as if FH5 still has to try and feel realistic to some extent. You may think it's weird that I praise FH3 for being believable, while criticizing FH5 for trying to be realistic, but you have to understand the context. I like FH3's boundless ocean because I can believe in a fantasy Hot Wheels world structured this way, while FH5's I dislike because it's already a giant floating pizza disc. I don't want these environments to try and be explained to me by being held up by these giant pizza slices. I feel as though FH5's map design also takes a hit to its track design too. While it still thankfully keeps its iconic boost pads, it's actually lost two very important pieces of track design that absolutely hurts once you notice it's gone. First are the jumps. There is only a single built-in track jump in this entire expansion, while the rest are just for danger signs which lead to nowhere. In contrast to FH3, which had jumps everywhere, jumps into the halfpipes, jump throughout the city, a jump that leads into two paths, depending on your speed. This actually correlates to the second piece of missing track design, that being that there's just barriers everywhere. There's no place to fall off the track in the entire expansion, and in turn, no risk. Granted, I'm not saying I want you to be able to fall off every single piece of road, but having specific corners where you turn too tight or you don't break early enough making you tumble to your demise is just a core aspect of FH3's Hot Wheels that is just missing now. This combined with FH5's weird fear of jumps both seem to give the impression that Forza doesn't want you falling off this track at all which is super counterintuitive to the high-speed, risk-reward, destruction-oriented racing that Hot Wheels brand itself on. But no, FH5 wants everyone to stay perfectly fine and happy on the track where everyone wins, undermining the spirit of Hot Wheels in the process. This is why FH5's Hot Wheels just doesn't work as well for me as FH3's does. FH3 was raw and unabashedly Hot Wheels, getting to drive your real cars as if they were life-sized versions of the toys you had as a kid is a feeling unmatched. Something FH5 fails to recapture, as now Hot Wheels feels as, like, just a place to take your cars to a cool loop, or see some snow. Otherwise, I really don't see myself coming back to this expansion, aside from when it's required in the playlist. This in contrast to FH3, where I sometimes preferred the Hot Wheels map to the base map, and that's, again, an impressive feat considering how amazing 3's base map was. So, Expansion 1 ended in a letdown. Let's hope at least Expansion 2 will end up being a proper expansion to look forward to and drive in all the time. With a year of time since launch, hopefully the directors have realized how dirty and off-road centric the brown base map is, and will take this into consideration and give us a proper high society place to draw- Are you kidding me? Is this a joke? Or are they genuinely just taking the piss? They have to be self-aware. They have to be. There is no way. So, after about another half a year long wait, we get FH5 Rally and Expansion. Can we talk about this now? Remember how I talked about FH5's expansions breaking the mold of previous games? Yeah, they did that by literally copying the homework of FH1 and 3, and somehow doing both worse, while taking twice as long to do it. In a game that desperately needed a second map because the base one was so catastrophically bad, but no, instead, for our second expansion, we get a slightly improved version of the base map with the exact same tone and color palette, still no modern civilization, and a complete insult to the concept of rally. At the very least, I guess, the canyon roads weave a lot more than the base map and make for better road and track design because thankfully this map isn't tarnished by a this abomination. But that's where the praise for this ends. This expansion does absolutely nothing. No, its idea of rally is the exact same as the base game, but now we have turn signals and split times. Great, a PNG and a different presentation of telemetry already stuck in the game. This is worth paying $20 for, apparently. This expansion fundamentally misses the precision high-octane driving of Rally, something even Horizon 1 understood. While that expansion genuinely felt like a fun love letter to Rally fans, FH5's feels like it just took a chunk of the base map, tore it off before release, repackaged it for expansion, and slapped Rally over the top to try and give it some vague theme that it doesn't live up to in the slightest. 
Then to try and lean into this theme, they do the bare minimum and stick some PNGs on your screen mid-race. What a disgrace. I would genuinely forget this expansion existed if I wasn't spawned here every time and if I didn't have to come here for the playlist. Otherwise, it's completely worthless and is by far the worst expansion in the series. While Horizon 1 actually cared about its source material and created its own rally trails, made you use iconic rally cars with a specific upgrade system to make said cars accurate how they drive in rally, and also had the goal to make said expansion actually difficult to complete as a testament how difficult and dangerous real rally is. Horizon 5 instead dumps you into the same dull, dreary, open world, might I add, open world in a rally themed expansion. Anyone with half a brain cell knows that those things don't correlate. But no, FH5's insistence on freedom and open world has completely gutted any semblance of real rally you could have, with the exact same career structure as the base game with nothing new about it. I genuinely don't have much else to say about FH5 Rally, cause what the hell is there to say? Oh cool, we have time trials now. You know Rivals exists in the base game, right? This expansion bundle for FH5 is a complete ripoff. 40 US dollars for a half-assed, completely butchered clone of ideas done previously is just not worth it in the slightest. Instead, hop onto eBay and pick up a copy of Hot Wheels Unleashed for around 30 bucks, and any of the PS3 360 Dirt games for maybe 10 bucks, and you've gotten yourself a much better, fleshed out, and faithful experience that adhere to its source material. And you'll probably end up saving money in the process. Safe to say, expansions are yet another aspect FH5 has completely failed in. Say what you want about FH4 LEGO, at least it was original and had new ideas. This year in FH5 is just straight pathetic. I hope Playground Games can see their catastrophic mistake in FH5 and create expansions that will actually cover the weaknesses of its future Horizon titles, while also being actually original. A perfect example of this would be FH3. The base game was very asphalt heavy, so an off-road expansion wouldn't actually hurt. Plus, snow had never been done before in the series to that point. So Blizzard Mountain was by definition a perfect choice and is still the best snow in Horizon history, while having an entire map take place on the side of a massive mountain is a fantastic concept. Then FH3 helps cover a fantastical element of Horizon taken to its extreme and in the best way possible, and was radically new and groundbreaking for the time and in general, a blast to race around in. I really hope Forza can return the quality of its expansions back to how they were in Horizon 3. Otherwise, I would genuinely consider skipping buying these for future installments. Forza Horizon's online and competitive scene is one that's seen its fair share of ups and downs over the years. I'll be honest, if I was to tackle the online of this monolithic series, I sure as hell wouldn't be able to get anything more than surface level, which is why I've asked a professional and good friend of mine, Quack, to dig into the sandbox of misery which is the current state of Horizon Online. Take it away, Quack. When you think of a competitive racing game, you might consider Assetto Corsa, iRacing, Gran Turismo 7, or maybe something more niche like Automobilista 2 or R Factor 2. Forza Horizon 5, in all its extremely PG casual arcade racerness, is certainly not the first name that comes to mind. However, in the darkest corners of Discord, Facebook and Reddit, there lurk a few tight-knit communities who choose FH5 as their battleground to duke it out in team races, free-for-all championships or time trials. My game tag is SWR Quackula but people call me Quack. I've been a member of the Horizon competitive racing community for over three years, and I'm here to add my bit relating to how FH5's competition has ebbed and flowed over all the time the game has been released. Enjoy. Competitive racing in Forza Horizon, for most people, is confined to the cobwebbed ranked racing button lost since FH4. It is the depressing, cold landscape of Bone Shakers, Ford GTs, Honda Civics and Koenigsegg CTGTs, where drivers will do anything to eke out a few more points from the shattered, barely functional ranked system, including blatantly cheat. For those with a bit more interest in their pace in the fastest cars, Rivals has survived the purge of competition in FH5 and lurks at the far side of the weekly festival playlist, or on a blank uninviting button dwarfed by the online racing icon on the online tab. Still infested with meta cars and cheaters, the Rivals leaderboards offer some sanctuary from the ramming of ranked, may it rest in peace, but the challenge of working out where the fastest legitimate time is falls to the people who set them. The locations of the fastest times have ranged from top 1 on the occasional mostly cheat-free DLC 
keyboard to just outside the top 2000 on the Goliath and S1 class. Granted, Playground Games has put in the effort to remove a large portion of the cheated times on these leaderboards, but in some cases this has resulted in legitimate times also being removed en masse. Online racing does exist, but at launch it consisted of the dismal randomised online adventure, where S2 and S1 cross country seem to make far more appearances than anything else. Thanks to the developers adding custom open racing, or CA after the custom adventure from FH4 as it is affectionately known by many, the chance was granted to select a specific class and road discipline, something that attracted many more players, with the unfortunate consequence of summoning the armies of less than clean drivers back into its midst. The trial, complete with its AI trained to ram and the drivers with absent brakes, doesn't even bear thinking about. This is all beginning to sound a bit gloomy, and make no mistake, there is plenty to complain about. However, there are some surprisingly developed competitive communities that have made the best of what little supply PGG has strip fed them over the years of Horizon games, and in some cases flourished into large groups of players thanks to precious few like-minded, hard-working, passionate individuals. Discord servers such as Forza Team Wars allow teams of drivers to compete at the very highest level of racing, whilst Racing Haven encourages drivers of all skill levels to battle in free-for-all tournaments and Horizon Racing Academy offers Gran Turismo-esque license tests intended to improve the raw pace and consistency of a driver. These, and many more, show a glimmer of hope for what the Forza Horizon franchise could be with a little time, love and WD-40. There are several elements of Forza Horizon games which have proved both integral and inconvenient to setting up these events over the lifespan of the Horizon series. While there were some features contained in FH3 and FH2 which could have fundamentally changed the way events were run, such as private lobbies, real story starts in FH2, FH4. COVID-19 and its associated lockdown brought hundreds, if not thousands, of players, myself included, out of their regular work or school commitments and plopped them in front of a computer, an Xbox or a PlayStation, to try and combat the crippling boredom of being confined to the house. This led to a huge boom in competition and activity, and the larger audience led community members to start forming their own individual safe spaces for competitive drivers. While FH4 was far from the perfect platform and left much to be desired in the way of features and reliability, people made it work with care, dedication and a sheer love for competition. Well-known key elements to this competition included custom tracks, convoys, blueprint restrictions and shareable tunes. While these were far from new to racing games, they allowed variety to spring from the map rather than racing on the same layouts the developers had implemented at launch. Huge tracks could be created for long, gruelling endurance races, or tiny short tracks could be formed for close proximity battles. We didn't realise how good we had it, even in the dark days before FH5's launch. Make no mistake, FH4 was not without its flaws. The everlasting game of guessing what would possibly be broken in the coming update never got old, and the new game-breaking errors always surprised us in some new and exciting way. A particular memory of mine consisted of acting as a last-minute substitute for a team race on a custom track. Thanks to FH4's wonderfully optimised blueprint system, amid multiple device and game restarts from every player involved, it took no less than 16 attempts and nearly 2 hours to start the race, only for every single player to disconnect from the session shortly after taking the first corner. Nonetheless, the second race of this championship worked without flaws, and all 12 players completed the 30 minute blueprint. You would think that FH5 improved on such things, and listened to the community members on its not so beautifully crafted suggestions hub. You really would hope that that game was an improvement. The week FH5 launched onto the scene was one of the most active I have ever seen the competitive servers. The excitement of the new UI, cars, map and features was intoxicating. Once those of us used to not equipping ABS finally worked out the intricacies of the new braking system, the driving was fun too. Even the first official monthly rivals event featuring the disgustingly heavy feeling an understeery Mercedes AMG 1 on the now iconic Horizon Mexico circuit, or HMC for short, attracted a huge amount of attention. Then the issues started to come to light. The first? A horrendously game-breaking glitch spawned from a brand new, well-intentioned feature which allowed the player to apply a tune in the start menu for a race, instead of having to quit an event to apply upgrades and then load back in. An additional factor that added to the catastrophe was the ability for race times completed in single player with or without AI to be uploaded automatically to the rivals leaderboards for the track and class, with the same collision and rewind flags as present in the rivals game mode. Sensible and convenient as this may seem, the leaderboards were suddenly bursting at the seams with tens of thousands of cheated times. Many players thought this was to do with a spam of cheating bot accounts, hackers or some other malicious act, until it started happening to competitive drivers, known to be trustworthy and clean over years of racing in the past. 
Drivers who would never even consider throwing away their reputation for a simple, suboptimal cheated time. Their game attacks, however, were plain as day next to some absurdly fast time in a stock car that was completely impossible. Eventually, people worked out what happened and reported it to Playground Games. When a player entered an event with a stock car and then applied a tune to it, the time would be uploaded to the rival's leaderboard as intended, but not at the PI or performance index of the car that had set the time. Instead, the time would correspond to the PI of the car that had entered the event before the tune had been applied. For example, a Volkswagen Beetle starting in low D class could be taken into an event and a tune could be applied to bring it up to the top of A class. Assuming the driver completed a clean time on the track, that time would then be uploaded to the D-Class leaderboards, obliterating the best attempts of the actual D-Class meta cars. Flight times could still be uploaded, but less attention was paid to these as they could have been executed with wall rides and or run-ups. PGG did end up removing this feature, hence fixing the issue of new glitch times being uploaded to the leaderboards, but it was far too little too late. The leaderboards were cursed with the rivals runs that showed no sign of being fixed any time soon. Indeed, it took until Series 14 for a certifiable attempt to be made to combat cheaters in the first place, but while again it was born of good intentions, it was less than suitable. For the Lincoln Co. TCR car on Player Azul for monthly rivals, a cap was put in place. Any times faster than the marker of 107.2 did not even make it onto the leaderboards, ensuring cheated ridiculously low times were impossible to submit. The issues arose when top players started setting times well into the 106 territory. Fortunately, through contacts at Playground Games, the community was able to get this changed. At the end of the month, the world record sat at a significantly faster 106.455. Future monthly rivals, as well as additional leaderboards, would not feature this cap in the future, due to PGG not knowing the potential lap times. A good element that arose from this was that finally the developers started to make a concerted effort to remove some of the cheated times from the remainder of the leaderboards. This had good intentions, but quickly became even worse than before. Soon after a portion of the cheated times disappeared into the ether, people started to realise that PGG had made a grave mistake. Some lap times set by top tier competitive drivers, even those documented on video to dispel any suspicion of foul play had vanished from the leaderboards completely. Not just a few, many times were removed, despite legitimacy being proven, and some as yet unbeaten records are still lost to the perch. We do not currently know if there will be any apology, replacement or otherwise. Legitimate lap times have continued to be removed to this day, and a notable example is the S2 world record for the Horizon Oval circuit. The legitimate record on the leaderboards itself sits at an 11.152 at time of writing, whereas the known record is an 11.139. The further example of PGG accidentally making a mess of the rivals leaderboards happened in Update 13, where an unknown bug, possibly linked to the changes in start-finish lines from the anniversary update, caused all Rivals Ghosts recorded in between the 18th of August and the 12th of October to be invalidated. When attempting to drive against these ghosts, a screen would pop up stating the ghost file was an older version and cannot be played back. This was a major inconvenience in more than one way. The main one you're probably thinking of is that any ghost a driver wants to race against to try and improve their lap time might not be there, when it had been for the previous several months. However, it also posed a problem for those who check the legitimacy of record times by unknown drivers. Ordinarily, it is acceptable to drive against ghosts of a driver to determine if they are blatantly cheating or not. With this new bug, it was impossible to check if some of these times are eligible for a new record without previously knowing the name of the driver who set it. Cheating has been an issue across the Forza Horizon franchise for many years, with illegal game modifications such as speed hacking, desync abuse, grip hacking, boost buttons, etc. This does not include the mythical super secret auto steer, not at all linked to the actual auto steer settings in the game, which some people seem to think all competitive drivers use. Speed hacking entails increasing the power of a car to unachievable levels to cause huge amounts of speed to be picked up easily and quickly. Decent abuse is a bit more complicated. It heavily utilises a known bug known as Xboxing. Xboxing, in its purest form, is when an Xbox player, despite finishing slightly behind a PC player, sometimes as much as a car length, gains a position at the finish line. This is caused by a slight delay in the starting time of a race for Xbox players against PC players. During the race itself, this has no impact beyond the usual lag bumps which are experienced between all players, but the way Forza calculates race results is based around the total race time, not the finishing order. This in itself is not a major issue as it does not explicitly advantage or disadvantage any player. After all, this is caused by a delay in the starting timer, so the total finishing time is not affected. However, some players discovered that this delay could be expanded through third-party software to extreme proportions. This would allow a player to skip the racing element of a race altogether. 
By forcing their race to start, say 15 seconds after everyone else, they would have the opportunity to simply hotlap without having to battle for the lead. Then, provided they finish less than 15 seconds behind the leader, which is a given in most lobbies, they would be handed first place through their finishing time. Naturally, this is a huge advantage to the cheating player. Grip hacking, as in the name, is using third-party software to increase the grip of a car. However, it is often incorrectly assumed that the cheats simply increase the grip of the tyres. Instead, the simpler and more effective option the offenders generally use is to increase the effect of gravity on their car. This reduces the chance of grip rolling on certain cars compared to increased tyre grip and overall improves stability. Boost button is the slang term for a manually controlled speed hack, where it can be turned on and off by the cheater as required. It allows the car to fly away at absurd speeds in a straight line, but come under controlled braking into a corner. This makes the car a lot more manageable, and can often be a faster alternative to outright speed hacking. It is called a boost button because of how it mimics nitrous oxide in other video games. I have not been specific about where to obtain these cheats or how to use them because I do not want them to become more prevalent online. So please do not go looking for how to cheat. If you're already a cheater watching this, just stop. It's pointless. Nobody is impressed with you. Desync, as mentioned above, can be a big problem in all Forza games. Known as netcode in simulators such as iRacing and Assetto Corsa Competizione, Desync essentially covers the desynchronization of two players' games. The main example is when contact is made between two cars on one player's screen and not on the other. Particularly prevalent in poor connections, this can mean in a tiny bump on one end results in a car being catapulted across the track on the other. While this in itself is unavoidable to PGG, the traffic in street races and the AI in the Trial and the Horizon Tour are significantly more prone and cause considerable problems when racing, particularly the traffic. If you have done online races in the past with traffic, you may have noticed that when another player collides with a the car, there is a delay, as much as a second, between the collision and the traffic car actually moving. This can be quite unpleasant when you are in the unfortunate position of avoiding the traffic's original path until the driver in front clips the car whilst trying to avoid it and sends it spinning across your path. While there isn't a huge amount PGG could realistically do about this, it's a frustrating issue that puts a lot of people off street racing. The AI and their decent habits, however, are the least of your concerns when racing in the Trial or the Horizon Tour. A major issue has risen over the lifetime of the game for FH5's slightly too good driver tar system. As some of you will know, the cars you see driven by the AI have learned how to drive like a real person from the people they race against in single and multiplayer. However, as some of you will also know, the AI have spent the lifetime of FH5 learning the finest techniques of ramming, blocking, swerving and barging from the best of the community. The culmination of this has been the incredibly erratic and unpredictable driving you see when completing the weekly trial event. This is a pretty big issue because it snowballs, with people teaching AI to ram, who teach more people to ram who then reinforce the AI's aggression. However, it's hilarious to watch, so we can let it slide. Ramming has been a problem in Forza since online racing was a thing. And finally, in FH4, PGG decided to pull something together and add some anti-ram measures. The ghosting system and the slowdown mechanic act as a mostly effective prevention against torpedoes and wall riding, but they are easily circumventable. Pushing, barging and aggressive moves are still easy to do, but that is the fault of the drivers doing them, and the ghosting system in particular is easily exploitable. While not always malicious, many drivers have at least once been significantly advantaged by the high-speed collision detected ghosting, me included. Unlike the ghosting at the start of the race, or that which happens when you slow down too much, the high-speed collision ghosting allows you to pass through destructible props, traffic and opponents. Linking into what I mentioned about desynced traffic cars, this means that fairly regularly, if the player in front of you hits a traffic car and slows down drastically, you will pass right through both them and the traffic car and continue on without a care in the world. This is more a matter of opinion, but I don't think you should be able to pass through traffic cars like that. The ghosting system was meant to prevent rammers, not obstacles in the track, but I'm open to the opinions of others in this matter. Slowdowns are another matter which leads to issues, but in the opposite way. In some occasions, they seem almost random in their effects. Sometimes you can wall ride an entire corner with absolutely no consequences. Sometimes you can tap a wall and be slowed down for as much as 7 seconds, and other times you can hit a pixel, I'll explain what that is soon for those of you who don't know, and come to a dead stop only to find a multi-second slowdown stopping your car from getting started again. Salt in the wound much. However, an issue arose with some of the recent cars, including the Celine truck from the Horizon Racing car pack, where even getting close to a wall would yield a crippling slowdown. At time of writing, these issues are still in the process of being fixed, but they are far from the only hitbox issues in the game. 
Pixels, as I mentioned earlier, are the names given to tiny pieces of scenery or tracks that stick out where they should not, and will bring your car to an immediate halt if you hit one. Think the sort of feeling you get when hitting the pole on the inside of the first turn on Cathedral Circuit, then imagine it completely unexpected. That's how it feels to have your race ruined by a pixel. While they are rare on the Horizon tracks, the Event Lab tracks, made before the snapping updates, are choked with them, no matter how well they are made. The main issue arises from the grey concrete barriers. Without snapping, it is next to impossible to stop these tiny discrepancies from appearing and causing potential clipping points for drivers. Hopefully, Event Lab 2.0, which has had limited testing at time of writing, manages to cover this issue properly. Another hitbox issue, which to my knowledge first originated in the MR2 SW20, caused the car to clip on some curbs or elevation changes. Some of the Horizon bridges would cause it to stop dead when running over a curb which other cars, even low-slung hypercars, tackle with ease. When the issue arose with the newly added AMD MG GT Black series, the issue with that car was fixed almost immediately, but at time of writing other cars still await the same treatment. Another issue with hitboxes can be attributed partially to the difference in checkpoints between FH5 and previous Horizon games. In the past, the only part of the checkpoint which was required to register a hit was the flag, but in Horizon 5 you are now required to hit the grey hub at the bottom of the checkpoint. While this probably seems like a very small issue to some of you, to competitive drivers including myself this is pretty noticeable. However, it also brought another issue to light which is potent and a lot more frustrating. Many cars with wide bodies, and some without, experience an issue when, with the wide body equipped, the checkpoint interaction will be identical to how it was without the wide body. Two of the main culprits are the RX-7 with the Time Attack kit and the Rocket Bunny GT86 and BRZ. You can see, when passing to the side of the checkpoint, that the archers do not interact at all with either the flags or the hubs. This also happens with other non-widebody cars, such as the Elise Series 1, but less severely. This car is specifically known due to its previous meta performance before exploration into other cars. Hopefully it is something that PGG pays attention to in the future, but who knows? Of course, when you miss a checkpoint because of this, particularly in an online race, you want to rewind, right? I realise this will bring out the anti-rewind crowd, but bear with me. Sometimes you might miss a checkpoint without realising, particularly in the examples with the wide bodies as mentioned, and have to rewind twice to get back far enough to actually pass through the checkpoint. It seems innocent, until you find yourself not rewinding the second time. Known as the rewind bug in the competitive community, it is an almost 100% repeatable bug where the second and third and fourth and so on will cause you to just sit still for a good while in the rewind screen with the car not going anywhere. Needless to say, this will completely ruin someone's race, causing them to lose as much as 30 seconds. PGG plus fix. It's been ages. Relating further to rewinds, they can be used in rivals for a little more than originally intended. Normally, they are used to find the potential of a car or tune, and to test its performance and drivability. However, they can also be used to remove some of the props near the start of a race, allowing for a faster time due to lack of obstacles. While this only affects props within the first few seconds of a lap, it is still a noticeable advantage on some tracks. In short, you can drive over a prop, drive more than the distance of one rewind past it, rewind back to the start of the lap, and profit. The props will reappear for the following lap. I can comfortably tell you about this method as it is used fairly regularly and provides gains that are not hugely substantial, and it is very time consuming to perform consistently. It is really just another little thing PGG hasn't sorted out. However, sometimes, for some mysterious and as yet unknown reason, an issue can arise where a car will not interact with destructible props at all. It is quite rare and has only happened to me a couple of times in my nearly 2000 hours of gameplay, but completely removes any disadvantage caused by hitting props. I don't personally see it as much of an issue, but it has the potential to be exploitable, and if you see someone passing through a fence with zero speed loss, that might be what's happened. Worse is the glitch in Event Lab, where the props in a race can disappear altogether. This only happens for Event Lab props rather than generic map props, but can cause a huge issue in competitive races, either greatly advantaging or disadvantaging drivers depending on the circumstances. This has in the past happened in a couple of competitive races, allowing a driver to pass through strategically positioned barriers and cut huge portions of the track away. However, it has also happened where parts or all of a Sky Track, a track made from Event Lab platforms not based on Horizon Road, have not spawned in, not allowing a driver to race at all. This will result in a restart of a race and causes little in the way of direct problems, but is a rather noticeable glitch considering the introduction of Event Lab 2.0, which has not been confirmed to fix this issue. The servers are also something of a barrier to online gaming with friends, 
Alongside the you have been disconnected notification every living person knows about, it is far from uncommon to have one or multiple players disconnect pre or mid race. Sometimes even an entire lobby will disconnect at once, requiring the convoy to be reformed and taking extra time to start the race. While there have been improvements over the once crippling inability to even get into free run with a convoy, it is and will continue to be an issue, which unfortunately is unlikely to change until BGG replace the old tired hamsters in the wheels running their server power supplies. Sometimes, though this is far less common than FH5 compared to FH4, you can encounter something I call a cursed blueprint. This is when a specific blueprint, not layout and not specific to any track or combination of settings that we know of, seems completely unable to start with an online lobby. Sometimes the race will not even start, sometimes one or all of the players will get into the loading screen, sometimes some or all of the players will get into the race before disconnecting shortly after the first corner. To this day we don't really know why this happens, but it's an interesting little quirk that seems completely random. It can be rectified by making an identical version of the same blueprint and using that instead, but when the blueprint was created by a player not around at the time of the race, this can throw a spanner in the works, similar to what I mentioned earlier. Something that hasn't changed since FH4 is the meta, or the most effective tactic available. Meta cars have been a thing since the dawn of racing games, and present a stain on online racing for many people. However, a lot of people don't really know about the meta why it makes sense and what its implications are. As many of you will know, there are some cars that you constantly see online. Examples from B to S2, respectively, include the 74 Civic, the Bone Shaker, the Dodge Viper Anniversary Edition and the Brabham BT62. These are online metagars and are fairly widely known. Those of you who do not frequent rivals might be less familiar with other cars, such as the Holden Tirana, the KTM Crossbow, the Lamborghini Diablo GTR, and the Hot Wheels Bad to the Blade. These are also meta cars, as are a surprisingly long list of others, which can be overwhelmingly dominant in their respective categories, extremely niche and good at one track, or anywhere in between. As a general rule, a meta car arises when it achieves some sort of overarching statistic over everything else in its class. For example, the Bad to the Blade has ridiculous handling compared to every other car while staying in S2 class. It is so dominant in this aspect that it currently has two world records in the dirt category despite it not being equipped with off-road race tyres, something almost every other dominant dirt car has in any class due to how much better they are for dirt than any other tyre. Though they have been covered by a large number of big Forza YouTubers, Power builds are still a relatively unexplored aspect of the game by the wider community, despite them making up a large portion of the current meta. As FH5 has a lot of power based tracks, they are often viable for use online. A power build, by definition, is a car which sacrifices other traits such as launch, traction, and handling for pure, outrageous acceleration and straight line speed. Most effective in the lower classes of racing, power build might entail a car having north of a thousand horsepower in D, which despite its limited handling, enables it to pull away on the straights with such potency that even the best of handling cars stands no chance. They are featured in all classes, as a meta option for many tracks, even C Cross Country is dominated by a horrendously unpredictable and difficult power build of the Reliant Supervan. The reason they are rarely seen online is mainly due to them being extremely difficult to drive consistently. While easier now than they were in FH4, driving a power build well still takes practice and mastery of throttle control, compared to the ease of the all-wheel drive meta most choose to take advantage of instead. The way these cars actually work is by taking advantage of the Performance Index, or PI as I will continue to refer to it as, and how it calculates the values. A car's PI is calculated by being driven by an AI around a certain test track, something we know little about overall, in its completely untuned configuration. This is where power builds come in. An untuned power build will generally be near impossible to keep in a straight line, much less drive well, and the AI reflects that when it calculates its PI value. However, a competent tuner can easily rein in the car's more chaotic tendencies and turn it into a somewhat drivable monstrosity. This is why, when upgrading engine components in some cars, the PI simply stops increasing after a point. The AI's lap time just doesn't get better. The best example of this PI manipulation in practice, whilst not being a power build, was the Scourge of B-Class in FH4, Top Gear Tractor. A hugely difficult car to drive in its optimal upgrade configuration, it could be tuned into something ridiculously quick and very meta, so much so that alongside the Bone Shaker, it was blacklisted from online adventure. Quality of gameplay has arguably been heavily impacted by power builds, but there are some updates in the past which have really messed up the entire community, not just the competitive side. I'll cover some of these now, and then we'll wrap up. Something similar to power builds but significantly worse that you may all have heard of is the Racer Tachyon incident. 
An update in the past brought drift transmissions to the game, much to the interest and enjoyment of many players. However, it took a matter of hours before people realised that the drift transmissions added to the Razer Tachyon Speed and the Jaguar I-Pace did a little more than intended. The Tachyon was by far the worst. The drift transmission's default ratios limited the car to a speed of around 30 km per hour, making it utterly useless in any races. The PI was dropped accordingly to high A-Class. What the game engine failed to realise was that this wonderful new drift transmission could be tuned. Naturally, this meant that you had a high A-Class car with, admittedly weak, S2-Class performance. Oh dear. In short, Absolutely everything was left in the dust by an electric car that was crushing records by seconds everywhere it went. A-Class Online Adventure was soon completely shut down due to this disaster, while PGG worked out what on earth they were going to do. They could remove the drift transmission for the car, but that would break all the tunes that were already uploaded for it in its new configuration. They could remove all A-Class tunes for it as well, but that would cut people's credit earnings from them. Instead, they made the decision to blacklist it and the much less affected but still slightly overpowered Jaguar I-Pace from online altogether. At time of writing, this is still the case, and the Razor still has its reign of terror in its own little world where it can't hurt anyone else. Another change that affected the entire game was the physics update, released in June 2022. This had a notable effect on a lot of cars, particularly those with a high centre of gravity. Throughout this update, cars such as the GMC Jimmy, Jeep CJ5 and Reliant Supervan went from being meta to borderline undrivable. Grip rolling, flipping off curbs and simply falling over became commonplace, making some cars impossible to use online or in rivals. Fortunately, this was mostly changed back in the following update, but cars with inherent instability such as the Supervan was still almost impossible to drive, to the point that some records set in the pre-physics update still stand today. Most tunes needed an update after this to make sure they were optimal again, and it shook up a lot of people to see how easily PGG could throw around the meta without even really meaning to. Some speculate this was to accommodate the Hot Wheels expansion which will be released soon after, but this has never been confirmed as far as I know. I mentioned earlier about PGG's concerted effort to remove cheaters from the leaderboards. This also included the implementation of an anti-cheat feature around the same time period. While this was nowhere near as monumental as the previous instances, it did make a difference, partially a good one. While there was a noticeable hidden FPS for a number of players, including myself, it did make a noticeable difference to the number of players using cheats online. It did not block everything, far from it, as footage is still around of cheaters immediately after the update, but they are far less rampant than they once were. Something that seems to come and go by update is the memory leak. This affects some players where they see a steady decline in FPS over time, to the point where the game becomes completely unplayable after anywhere between 30 minutes and 4 hours of gameplay. It seems to work due to FH5 munching on RAM like Chrome with 50 tabs open, but there's no specifically known cause as of yet. Finally, something that is more to do with a lack of update than anything else, where are my split times? If some of you are watching this from the competitive community, you may know that I've casted a number of races in the past, so I know the drill. I also know how painful it is remembering the good times of FH4 where one could see the distance between drivers from one player's screen. It was much easier then to tell if the player being commentated was catching, losing time, being caught or running away. It had some issues when confronted with large time gaps, but it certainly would have been beneficial to have an FH5. I know I would love to see it. So to wrap up, I know I've complained a lot about this game. There are a lot of issues and little problems that most people don't really notice. Make no mistake, however, Playground has really stepped it up with their recent updates, and I'm happy to see the route the game is taking. Hopefully it will continue, and the Races of Horizon will see an ever-improving platform for their beloved community come out of the darkness. I'd like to say a massive thank you to my good friend Noobster, who has been a massive help with a lot of the research for this segment, and also to my other good friend Moses for letting me monologue about FH5 for so long in his video. I've held you lovely audience members by the throat for too long now, so I'll hand you back. Thank you for listening, and enjoy the rest of the video. Goodbye. Now we've been over many of Forza Horizon 5's flaws at this point, yet there's one that's debatably the most in-your-face example of anti-consumerism and shameful game practices, and that's the handling of the series' content and extending a game's life cycle. Forza Horizon 4 released in an incredibly poor state, and over time brought itself up to being a pretty good game by the time Horizon 5 rolled around. It added endless new cars, features, game modes, the list goes on and on. Forza Horizon 5, upon launch, removed a lot of the features that Horizon 4 added, 
leaving us a game which was missing things like the backstage pass, midnight battles, hundreds of cars from the last game, and beauty spots. The approach for these games is that of get it out to the public first and add on to it and make it the game it should have been at launch by the end of its life cycle. This is evident through the removal of previous cars being slowly dip-fed back in when the game is still relatively fresh, only to add the really good stuff when player numbers dip too low and critics start pointing it out. This also goes alongside features like Events Lab, which are painfully underbaked at launch, despite being a main selling feature, only to release a 2.0 version two years after launch, which is what Events Lab should have been from the start. Then there's the case of blatant lying with new features like Horizon Tour, simply being a repackaged version of the trial with a new name. We have mentioned time and time again that building upon an existing game with new content is not an issue. In fact, it's a great thing, but when you hold back a game at launch, only to make it good right at the end, and withhold content from the last game, in addition to that, makes things a borderline scam. At the end of the day, this video wasn't made to bash on Playground, or Forza as a whole. This was made by people who love this series, grew up with it through childhood, and want it to be the best it possibly can be. We can only hope that this encourages those of you watching to spread this video with the goal of attracting Playground Games' attention, as it's time for change. We would also love to interact and support those of you in the comments below with your feedback and critiques regarding the series. Though let's try our best to keep things constructive now, shall we? By now, we've said all we want to say on this game and what it means to us, but we're not the only two people out there with strong opinions on this franchise. There are thousands, millions even, with their own experiences and thoughts when it comes to Forza Horizon, and that's why we've decided that we want your voices to be heard. Over in our public Discord server, we hosted a channel for an opportunity for some of you guys to use our platform to tell us what you want most for this series. To end this video off, I'm going to share these with you now as one last final thank you to all of you who have stuck with us for the whole grueling two hours of this video. Starting us off is my friend and fellow content creator Fastminer07, who has this to say about Forza Horizon 5 and its customization. Although they made some improvements to the customization in recent updates by adding things like anti-lag turbos or a large number of new rims for the cars, there are still some improvements that could be made to the customization. I'd say a relatively easy update would be to add a couple more options for things like Forza Arrow, instead of just being stuck with the old style plank spoiler or the cookie cutter oversized wing, giving the player a few more options that basically fit to almost every car. Or if they have the ability and time, draw from the autosculpt idea NFS pioneered in the 2000s for even more player freedom in their visual customization. A massive thank you once again to Fastminer for being a part of this video. It would be ever so appreciated if you were to go down to the description and take a look at his channel because he makes some of the best racing game content on YouTube. After that, we have a long-term friend of mine and also a fellow content creator, Detective Fat Weedington, who submitted his own voiceover segment. What I despise most about Forza Horizon 5 is not only that the game holds your hand 24-7, not only that the presentation makes Sesame Street look like the Wolf of Wall Street, and not only that the map feels like actual purgatory, but that the game doesn't even have to try to challenge the player at any given moment. Instead, the game presents you with this dull campaign that has no purpose other than to squander your time. Horizon Adventures has to be one of the most uninteresting campaigns I ever played in video game history, let alone the racing game genre. And it just shows that you don't even have to be good in order to progress through the game, and that the racing itself is just second nature since you don't even have to be third or higher in order to win because you are winner. Which is not a good mindset to have. And it simply boggles my mind on what's the point of doing this if everything is just going to be provided to you with no sets of hoops for you to jump through. Now I get that you want to bring in newcomers into the series because that's how you keep your series up afloat, but bear in mind you're bringing in individuals who knows little to nothing about cars. The same people that say they will go on a Drake and drive on ironically. If your game especially gives you a high-end car at the beginning of the game that anyone with a half-functioning brain can spot, you've obviously messed up. A massive thank you to Weedy Woo as well. Now for the rest of you who submitted yours, I will be personally voicing, starting with Quack, who in contribution to making his own segment to this video, also wanted to share his thoughts on other aspects of FH5. 
which goes as follows. A handful of points. In December of 2021, the drift zone point system was changed, reducing the point gain by about 20%. People noticed this immediately, and the devs still waited until February of this year, 14 months later, to actually remove the old scores so players could set PBs. Then, a few weeks later, the devs messed up the point game again, reducing the point gain by 1-2%. Not a huge change, but it has made the big drift zone, cara este, impossible to set world records on. This has not been changed or acknowledged in any way by the devs. Drift zone borders are also hilariously bad. Pretty much every single zone has some areas where you can go very far off the road and still get points. The use of this is allowed on one zone for various reasons. Here's what it looks like. Open drift was changed from FH4 to 5 in a few big ways. FH4 had drivetrain separated lobbies, so players using rear wheel drive and all wheel drive wouldn't be competing against each other. This was removed in FH5. FH4 also had much longer timers for open drift, meaning that multiple laps were possible on every track. The current timers for FH5's open drift make it impossible to even get two laps in on some tracks, meaning any single potential mistake means a loss since you get no redos and since rewinds are disabled. FH4 also mixed S1 and S2, including A and B classes into two respective groups, making for a massive amount of car variety. In FH5, you only get S1 and A class as the two separate lobbies, meaning that anything that's just barely S2 can't be played, and the tons of cars that don't fit into A class now compete with meta cars in S1. The car variety for A class is terrible because of this. There are all of four good cars, the Isetta, the Willys, the Renault 8, and a small handful of cars that are basically just worse versions of the Willys. Danger Signs used to have a different ramp that was better, making some danger signs, like the runway danger sign, now impossible to set world records on. Then there's the time that the devs messed up the top speed of the Yesco, making it closer to 340 when it's only supposed to go 310. This was reverted about a month later, but scores set with this buffed Yesco are still up. The next submission was submitted by a great friend of mine who's been around since only a few thousand subscribers. Here's what Koosh says to say about Forza Horizon 5. For me, Forza Horizon 5 is one of those cases where the game took one step forward, but two steps back. While the game fixed some of the issues the franchise had, its terrible campaign, with no sense of progression, the repetitiveness and lackluster representation of my home country, just made the single player experience very boring and uninteresting. The way they shove Mexican culture down your throat in a stereotypical and exaggerated way results in a very sad misrepresentation of my country, and please don't get me started on the horrible Spanglish lines the characters say. I haven't cringed this hard with a video game in a while. While the multiplayer, car sounds, and track builder are solid in this game, the horrible and robotic AI, online connectivity issues, sound and visual glitches that never get fixed, as well as the boring and badly designed challenges and campaigns you need to complete to unlock cars, made me uninstall and not play it for a while. In my opinion, Playground needs to focus more on their core fanbase and what Horizon used to represent. A celebration of automotive and festival culture, with all of the color and passion that exists for both. At the moment, it doesn't feel like a celebration or a festival, but more like an empty open world with zero personality or direction. I really hope Playground makes an effort to bring back the True Horizon DNA, but I seriously doubt it. Given their track record, it seems like Horizon will keep its current state, a jack of all trades, but master of none. The next submission was sent in by Weon, the gentleman who did the beautiful thumbnail for this video, and here's what he has to say. My stance on FH5 is based on the following, a quite good game that didn't take enough steps forward. There are a lot of aspects that one can see the game on which it succeeded at some points and failed on others. I'll try to mention the ones that are more important to me and are crucial to the player experience on a general way. Progression. This has been the most critiqued and discussed part of the game with its fair share of reasons. The accolades that would unlock the chapters of your career, although were a fine idea, did not have great balance. You would essentially get your points fast enough to progress on the career mode extremely quick. This is only amplified by the unbalanced and extremely rewarding wheel spins one gets because the races and the things one does outside of the wheel spins don't give you that much money. 
There aren't any special official events or races that would offer more money than the normal races, apart from events like the Goliath. There's not an increasing or noticeable natural learning curve that shows you how you have to be performing from the first races to the last. As expensive and better cars are given to you, you are guaranteed to get successful at the game. There are no pushbacks or barriers that one must accomplish in order to get to the end game. You just unlock the chapters and do the races without limitations, apart from your free time. And then, you're done with the game. I tried to go in a more nobody becomes the ultimate driver type of gameplay, by driving slower cars in the first races. And as I was heading to things like the Gauntlet, the Colossus, or the Goliath, I was driving faster cars. It felt rewarding, but it wasn't as natural or satisfying as previous games, mainly Forza Horizon 1. It was clear that Playground Games was focusing on having a more sandboxy game and not a linear one. But without certain limitations, the campaign felt soulless or uninspiring, which is a shame because it had potential. The accolades, chapters, the Horizon story modes, the wheel spins, and the way you would get the cars would have worked just fine or even better if they change or adjust certain things. Rebalancing these elements, make it more cohesive and more natural, make it so that the learning and progression curve would have felt more satisfying to accomplish without having to change this easier approach to the game's campaign. This career would have been a joyful and entertaining one if they would have taken some more steps forward. Speaking of entertaining, I want to jump into style and vibe. The Horizon Festival being located in Mexico would have offered so much more than what we got considering Mexico has some insane and beautiful landscapes that would have fitted right in there with Horizon in the festival. I actually liked how they approached the cultural side of things with Mexico with the respective vegetation, buildings, and architectures. But apart from a few spots in the map, the game doesn't scream Mexico, which would be acceptable if those surroundings would look or feel good, which it doesn't. A large portion of the map consists of the desert, fields, flat, uninspiring, and unappealing landscapes. The map is extremely important as it will be the place where we will take most of the time to drive around and experience the game. It's a make or break point to this type of game on which unfortunately FH5 could not deliver. This previous point was amplified by the desaturated color palette that, while although realistic, doesn't look all that good. Which is a shame considering that with the right color scheme the game would have felt better. As shown on the first drive with FH5 and the gameplay showcases Playground game released before its launch. Horizon 1, with its set of flaws and limitations of the graphics department, made up with the most intense and vibrant color palette. Though this is more of a late 2000s, early 2010s thing with the, um, piss filter. The same can be said for FH2 and 3. Last but not least, the festival vibe itself wasn't that intense in this game, unfortunately. Yeah, it managed to feel better than FH4's festival vibe, or lack thereof, but it didn't stand out. Apart from the main festival sites, you're not reminded that there's a lively and active festival going around. When it comes to the festival playlist and online, I'll be less extensive with this, as plenty of people here have already claimed their problems with it. But there's still room to at least talk about the online aspect in a general manner. About the festival playlist, although it has seen some improvements in comparison to FH4's or even early FH5 series, the playlist needs some changes and updates with things like the points one can get, the events and challenges one needs to do, the theme of the series and how it correlates to the playlist itself. About the Eliminator, there's room to improve it, as it hasn't seen any updates since its introduction back in FH4, and as FH5's map is bigger, the events take longer to finish and it's hard to find opponents to challenge. There is also a lack of game modes that could be made that would accompany the Eliminator. Ranked Online Racing has been eradicated from FH5, which in the long term harmed both the pro players and the inexperienced ones, as because the pros don't have a space to race each other on events that take itself more serious. The pros have to race on the normal online races, destroying the inexperienced players that don't take it seriously. The Horizon Tour is extremely forgettable and also has room for improvements to make it more interesting. The Horizon Arcade is quite fun. The updates it had over the Forzathon of FH4 are appreciated, but the game doesn't push you in order to play them. Apart from all of those points, it seems Playground Games is taking the proper time to make the game better, experiencing with the way you progress on Hot Wheels and the Rally Adventure expansions, deleting some of the cheaters from the leaderboards, releasing exciting content on the series updates, not only from a car list aspect, but on a feature and gameplay aspect as well. And so we hope that with the way they've been learning their mistakes, improving this game and listening to the community, that the next entries are going to be great. As for FH5, 
Even with its mistakes and flaws, I still appreciate a lot of the things that make it a good game. Next up is another long-term friend of mine who's been around for about two years now. Here's what Moon has to say about FH5. I don't think FH5 is at all horrible. I think the intention to make a good Horizon game exists, but it was executed so poorly that in an effort to fix some of the things that were wrong in FH4, they messed up other things and other issues ignored by the team. Carried over to the fifth game, making it not only feel the same, but wasting a lot of potential in a big and varied map like Mexico. This is reflected by the community creations that managed to make better things than the original game made. I don't want to talk badly about the developers, the ones coding and making the environments, but the blame is on the higher ups. That in an effort to make a blockbuster game, they turned a game that felt like the dream festival for car enthusiasts into another generic racing game that desperately tries to appeal to all audiences, failing in the process and losing long-term fans. As a side note, as a Hispanic person, I hate the Spanglish of this game. We don't communicate like this at all under any circumstance. We never mix English and Spanish voices. We either talk in English, Spanish, not both. In a way, it feels insulting and way more stereotyped. This next entry was submitted by one of our Discord users, Nur24Racer, who has this to say. The most important of my problems is multiplayer. Only 12 people get synced at a time. This makes it impossible to make something with a full lobby and free roam, as there is always a random synced and you can't see someone from your group. In FH4, you could see more than 12 players at a single time. That way, cops vs racers, car meets, and everything else you would meet up in free drive was possible to do with a full convoy. As a second point, FOMO. When the cars from Stellantis came back, some cars were available at the auto show to be bought by everyone. Some of the returning cars were only available via the season playlist. It's bad for the people playing the game since the start and don't want to miss out on any cars, like myself. Imagine you want to go on vacation. Yeah, I missed out on an Alpha. A car recycled from FH4. Feels bad. But it's even worse for new players. Would you recommend a game where you can only get half of the content nowadays? Because that's what FH5 is now. And there are so many nice cars locked away from players that just want to have fun in them. Like the Porsche 911 GT3 RS 4.0. A car previously available in Forza Horizon 4. Not in the launch of FH5, but added back shortly after in a playlist. As other Porsches were available from launch, I can't imagine there was a licensing issue. And while I think I've returned once, it's still far too rare for such a legendary car. Our next submission was made by another member on our Discord, Diamond Games 204 who has this to say. Progression in FH5 overall has many problems. And while the progression in the Hot Wheels expansion was a promising start, I feel like in the next installment, they won't rectify my main concern, which is how it's too reliant on the wheel spins. It's no secret that the credits gained from wheel spins vastly outnumbers those gained from the normal progression. This means that a substantial amount of the credits you gain throughout the game are based on a luck-based mechanic. Another side effect of wheel spins is that depending on your luck, you tend to get more cars from them than you would on your own. Why buy the car you want from the auto show or scour the auction house for good deals when you likely already have that car from a wheelspin you got ages ago? I'm not kidding when I say that throughout the whole time I've been playing Horizon 5, I've only had to buy cars from the auto show twice. If I needed a car for a specific event or seasonal activity, I'd usually find it gathering dust in my garage or just make do with a car I've already got if the event requirements weren't too specific. In my opinion, I think an ideal solution to that would be removing wheel spins altogether and optimizing credit rewards from normal progression. But as the wheel spins are likely here to stay, let's at least make them more fair. I'm not the first to suggest these, but I think that they would help if we want to improve the current system. First is to remove the useless cosmetic stuff from wheel spins. They're always frustrating to get, and it makes you feel like you wasted a spin. Next is to make any wheel spin exclusive cars available to also buy from the auto show so that no one's favorite car is locked behind a lock. Another thing is to lock certain car classes from being in wheel spins until that car class is unlocked by the player through normal progression. For example, if we're going with the Hot Wheels expansion progression, and then until unlocking A-class cars, no A-class or higher cars would show up in the wheel spins. Lastly is to maintain a similar credit gain for all players by removing the super high and super low credit rewards from wheel spins. For example, if the range of credits is five to three hundred thousand dollars, let's make it thirty to seventy thousand dollars. But I suppose that last solution is out of the question for the devs, as they added the useless one to five thousand dollar rewards in wheel spins post-launch. 
so I don't think me and the developers see eye to eye on that. Another one of my issues relates to the festival playlist. Personally, I don't like the idea of FOMO and limited time seasonal content in any game. But that is more the criticism of the entire games industry. I want to first start with how Playground Games have improved the seasonal content throughout the Horizon games. In Horizon 4, they made it so the playlist exclusive cars would be obtainable through backstage passes after end of life instead of being lost to time like in FH3. In Horizon 5, they made it so that the seasonal stunts have restrictions, making so that you have to think about the car you use instead of hopping out into a tricked out X-Class Ferrari 599X Evo and slamming the acceleration pedal. They also made the trial marginally less frustrating in Horizon 5 and added seasonal PR stunts for little variation. Now for a shift in tone, the festival playlist is still, at worst, frustrating and at best, mindlessly boring. The, season the seasonal races are still the same races that were already in the game. The event lab races are inconsistent and can sometimes be frustrating to complete either thanks to the race itself or the devs enforcing car restrictions that the original author didn't intend. The trial may have slightly improved over the years, but it still heavily depends on who you get in a team with. The festival playlist in both Horizon 4 and 5 quickly devolved into a weekly routine that to completionists like myself feels almost like a chore. The worst thing about Horizon 5's playlist is, is my opinion, the rewards. They are arguably worse than in FH4. In that game, more often than not, playlist exclusive cards would be spread out across the seasonal championships along with the seasonal point milestones. In Horizon 5, the new playlist exclusive cars are, more often than not, only available from the point milestones, while the seasonal event rewards are limited to useless cosmetics or cars you can already buy in the auto show. This essentially forces you to do these events whether you like them or not to get the exclusive cars. I dread when there is an exclusive new car in the 40 points milestone that either forces me to subject myself to these events for longer or just miss out entirely on getting the car without knowing if it'll ever be available again. This is also one of the reasons why I hate FOMO in any game. These last two submissions were from two people who didn't wish to have their parts voiceovered, so here they are in text form for if you wish to pause and read. First from Mr. Tom Foolery, who has this to say. And lastly, but certainly not least, is a submission from Path, who submitted a giant segment of its own that is so big we can't fit it all on the screen at once. So here it is broken up into segments. Just one last time, I want to give a massive thank you to everyone who wrote in to talk about FH5. I'm so glad we could provide you with an opportunity to voice how you feel on a franchise that means the world to us. Thank you so much to Quack, Stefan, Fastminer, and every one of you who worked on this massive project with us. Please head on down to the description and support them all as this would not have been possible without them. And finally, thank you 
for watching all of this two hour long behemoth. Your support means more than you will ever know, and we can only hope to see you again in the future. Though for now, once again, thank you.